Hello, everyone can hear us? Yeah. So, Martin, can I start? Yes, ma'am, please start. So, Namaskar and good evening, everyone. I welcome you all for today's webinar on lung cancer updates. And for this, I would like to invite, with immense pleasure, I would like to invite Dr. Venu Gopal, who is Senior Consultant, Medical Oncologist, Apollo Health City, Jubilee Hills, Netherabal, for the welcome and introductory note. Over to you, sir. Yeah, so a very good evening to all. I welcome you all to, to the today's webinar, uh, live webinar, recent updates in lung cancer. So if you see the outcomes in lung cancer were very dismal for the past few decades, what we can tell. But recently with the availability of new agents, the entire, there is a paradigm shift in the treatment and how we look at these patients and how we manage these patients nowadays. For example, as a matter of fact, if you take uh, NSCLC, so previously we used to treat it, you know, as a whole as an entity. Rather than that, now we are moving from there. We have moved to histological subtyping, to molecular subtyping, to now, in fact, even precision oncology-based treatments. So there is, a, you know, at the end of the day, with the availability of options like uh, IO therapy, IO plus IO therapy plus IO plus IO plus chemotherapy. So there. You know, there has been a paradigm shift in the treatment of these uh, patients, and we could see the light at the end of the tunnel. In the similar way, if you see the patients, non small cell lung cancer with the driver mutations, again, we have an ample of options in the form of suppose if you take EGFR, AL, CROSS1, BRAF, uh, Metexon, all these mutations, if you take, we have again the availability of you know, multiple options with that. The journey of these patients have significantly changed. And, and as you know very well, if you talk about the small cell lung cancer, for decades we had only, you know, the uh, conventional chemotherapy option was available in the form of platinum plus adoposide. But with the availability of fibro drugs, you know, atezolizumab and durvalumab, now we are looking the survivals in the range of, you know, three years. So three years survivals in the range of 15% with the IO plus chemo combinations, even in an aggressive histology like small cell cancer. So with this background, I think uh, without wasting much time, we'll go to uh, the topics today. Yeah, over to the organizers. Yes, sir. so to begin with, our first session is sponsored by our academic partner, Pfizer. And for this, I would like to invite Dr. A.V.S. Suresh, who is Senior Consultant, Hemato and Medical Oncologist at Continental Hospitals, Hyderabad. And he is going to deliver his talk on Norlatinib as frontline option in L plus MNSCLC. Over to you, sir. Uh, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, just let me share the slides and then see whether it is moving well or not. Uh, can you see the slides? Yes, sir. Wonderful. Very good evening and uh, thanks for giving the opportunity to share. A very nice drug. Nice drug by design. Nice drug uh, by all means to discuss uh, in this era of targeted therapy. So uh, I'll just explain uh, while uh, when, when we move on, why I call this so. So this is the disclaimer. If you look at the lung cancer, uh, Venu already told, it is a com second commonest diagnosed cancer across the world and leading cause of the cancer. Almost one-tenth of the cancer diagnosed and almost one-fifth of the deaths are because of the lung cancer. So the numbers itself speak. The number of diagnosed cases are only one tenth, but number of deaths are one fifth. That means the outcomes are very poor. It is not a very good disease to deal with. And we moved a lot. Just like Hodgkin's disease is uncommon compared to non Hodgkin's disease, small cell is uncommon to non small cell. So, though the name itself says it is a non small cell, it is a, the, but if it contributes to 80 85% of the cases. So, the five year survival is close to 25%. Uh, in patients with the early stage, but compared to uh, in advanced stage, it is only hardly 7%. So if you look at the numbers, they kept on adding because of the lifestyle and other diseases. So as the mortality, we expect it to be more and more and more. So today's topic is 
We know that lung cancer is different. You have EGFR, you have MAT, you have ARC, you have ROS, you have a uh, lot of other mutations. But today's focus is only on the ARC mutation. If you look at the incidence, I want to quote the Indian author here. The ARC rearrangement is seen anywhere between 1.6 to 11.7%. Where do you study and what is the type of population? So the Indian publication says it is around 8%. So what is this type of ALK rearrangement that you will be seeing? So if you look at foil domain mutation versus tyrosine kinase domain, in ALK, it is a constant one, but in AML, it keeps on being. Typically, these patients have adenocarcinoma. They are never smokers or light smokers, just like EGFR. Tend to occur in relatively younger patients. But one thing that we need to remember is brain meds are very common in these patients. If you have EGFR and ALK, they are mutually exclusive. If there are two mutations, probably ALK will always be the diagnosis. So what is this ALK? Let us assume that this is the natural sequence. ALK is here and uh, EML4 is here. That is anaplastic lymphoma kinase. So the movement, they match with each other. That means it has to flip 180 degrees and then sit in such a way that the inversion happens and then get reinserted into the chromosome, then only you have the active pathway kicking in. That's what was invented and reported in 2007. So when I just passed out my DM, there was no ALK mutation known in lung cancer patients at all. But once it was understood, it took hardly five years to develop the first TKI, that is chrysotinib, which made significant change in the survival of these patients. Then hardly next two, three years time, we have second generation drugs like seritinib, alectinib, and then came the newer generation drugs like lorlatinib. If I want to, if I try to draw an analogy between the EGFR and ALK, just like jeftinib, erlotinib are the first generation, but once osimertinib, that is the third generation came, the second generation somewhere got lost. Similar is the case, with the ALK inhibitors also. Once the first generation was there, the third generation, once it came into the picture, second generation somewhere lost its position. We'll discuss all those things. Questions to be asked to the experts. I think I, this is for the venue. So what is the incidence of ALK mutation in our clinical practice? What is the different testing platforms that we use? Do the ALK variant transfer kits have an impact on the outcome of the treatment selection? As I told you, EML ones have a variation where the ALK is so significant. So do we do those testings or not? So these are the questions we'll uh, discuss once we are into the panel. So what are the current options available? ALK positive NSCLC patients are, because they are young, you need to have a proper plan for them. As I told you, the metastasis happens in 20 to 40% of untreated patients and is a significant challenge. The problem for a few of these uh, ALK tyrosine kinase inhibitors is they themselves have cognitive impairment. Just like EGFR, while on treatment, they develop resistance. But resistance can be de novo also, right? So you need to have a drug that will not have the tendency to allow the mutations to happen and resistance to happen, that goes and settles into the CNS and will not let the CNS metastasis happen, or if the CNS disease is there, it is capable of dealing with that CNS disease. So what is the recommendations? Shall I have to screen every patient uh, whenever I find ALK positive for brain metastasis? NCCN does recommend that cranial MRI has to be done. It's just like a small cell lung cancer. Once it is stage four, it is mandatory to screen the brain. Even ESMO recommends CNS imaging with MRI. However, in clinical practice, we don't do MRI in all the patients. But PET scan, as a standard diagnostic tool, is 80% sensitive enough in diagnosing all the brain metastasis, though it may miss a few of them, which are especially very tiny. So what is the diagnostic imaging of choice? MRI scores over CT scan by all means. But if it is not feasible, CT with contrast is decently good enough. 
So once we understand that we need to evaluate the brain, then you come to the managing the CNS disease at the point of diagnosis for outbreak. Several systemic and local therapy options are available for managing CNS disease in patients with the uh, ALK positive. The conventional ones, the targeted ones, the chemotherapy drugs, whole brain radiation and surgical resections. Whereas the radiation and uh, surgical resections are local therapies, the one which you see on the left side are targeted therapy. There is no randomized trial, but for all those patients who never received radiotherapy to the brain, majority of them did achieve CNS complete remission when they're treated with the ALK. So the big question remains, shall I have to treat the brain with a local therapy is a bigger question. That is going to be answered in next one year's time because there are two ongoing trials to address the question. So what are the international recommendations? The current international recommendations for the first line treatment for ALK positive is alactinib, bragatinib or lorlatinib, category one. Other recommendations is seratinib, Useful circumstances is Kirizotin. All are category one because you have a level three, so phase three study supporting and a very strong evidence is there. But if you look at the design, probably you can make a better choice. So what is optimal sequencing? When you have three drugs, you always have to choose what is right and what is not. right. So there are two algorithms which I would like to draw your attention. Algorithm one. First line lorlatinib, use the best drug, like first line osimeritinib uh, sort of thing. Then if it progress, go for chemotherapy. This is what I personally feel is a better one because the patient get used to it, relatively safer drug. But the cost is prohibitively high. Then I go to the algorithm two, which is first line, second line, you know, go start with something like <laughs> resotinib and then just go with the seretinib or then go to the next line, Lord Latinib, and then Cuba. Here, you have a different set of side effect profiles. Algorithm 2 is relatively cost effective. So, what are the considerations? The problem is, in brain metastasis, usually I don't get anything in the blood because of the blood brain barrier. So, liquid biopsy was extended to do the circulating tumor cells in the CSF, and it was pretty much promising. So when I have a disease in the CNS, rather than going with the conventional CSF analysis, nowadays I'm preferring CTDNA on the CSF. And my yield has tripled, trust me. That is one of the best ways whenever there is a carcinomatous meningitis, or whenever you strongly clinically feel that this patient is having CNS metastasis, not a solid metastasis, but a, See, uh, meningitis sort of thing, then it, it, its yield is very good, right? Response to TK may also be influenced by the patient's characteristics, like the biological features of the tumor and other things, and quality of life should be kept in mind. So in summary, in newly diagnosed patient with ALK positive, the incidence of brain metastasis is very high. International guidelines recommend to do CNS testing. If at all any solid medicine is found, that's okay, but if you feel that it is carcinomatous meningitis, Probably CSF analysis with liquid biopsy is a good thing. Several TKs have been evaluated as a first-line therapy, but my choice is third-line. Uh, that is, uh, sorry, uh, third-generation uh, lorlatinib is my first choice. It is indicated and approved for the CNS metastasis. So let's see why I'm telling so. So what are the things which I need to deal with whenever I make a decision, right? Overall efficacy. Overall survival. What is the availability of second line? What is the CNS penetration? Response rates and progress to the survival. So under these classical six headings, my next 10 slides will be there. This drug is a selective ATP competitive, highly potent third generation ALK. As 75% penetration, awesome number. It has potential to improve the clinical outcomes with overall and intracranial activity. In previously treated all positive patients also. In addition, upfront also it showed response. So why it also is this is a design. I just want to tell you that if you look at the drug molecule design, the loop is closed. So what does it mean? It can go better into the brain and probability of developing resistance is very less. 
So that's the beauty of lorlatinib over and above the other ticas. So what is the rationale? So why I did a study to compare lorlatinib with the first leg? Why can't I wait for the first leg to fail and then just go for the third leg? So that's the question that I'm going to answer through the crown trial. So what does this crown trial tell us? What is the design, results, and conclusion? It was published in NEJ. It is a comparison between result in 50 milligrams twice a day, compared to lorlatinib twice a day. Almost 150 patients in each arm were chosen. The stratified by the presence of brain metastasis, yes or no, ethylsic. Because these are two known entities uh, that are going to influence the outcomes of the disease. So they have a pre-planned stratification done for these things. No prior systemic therapy for the metastasis to disease is one of the criteria. Endpoints is progression-free survival by blinded, you know, uh, the independent central limb. That is the meaning of BICR. ICR is independent uh, central limb, right? PFS by investigator, OS or object response, it is by BICR. IC, ORR, DR, that is uh, so duration of response, and ICGR, that is independent review by the ICGR and uh, by the, uh, the IDC. Intracranial responses are also planned analysis. So is the quality. Widespread all over the world, 104 study centers were there across 23 countries. Between 2017 and 2019, the study was conducted. Five patients in crizotinib did not receive the therapy as per the plan for various reasons. All patients underwent restaging every eight weeks. Very aggressive monitoring was done. As on 20 March 2020, so this is an interim cutoff date which is published uh, by the ESMO virtual group. One or three patients in lorlatinib arm and 31 patients in crizotinib arm remained on the study. So that means close to two-thirds of the patients in lorlatinib arm but only one fourth of the patients or one fifth of the patients in crizotinib arm remain on the study. The numbers speak very loud and clear that most of the patients on lorlatinib arm are continuing on therapy. So, as the results of the PFS, 18 versus 14.8 months. Let's look at the baseline characters. Are they balanced? They are perfectly balanced. No differences at all. So, this is the 18 months follow up data. The slides start separating at the end of third month. So beautifully, if the patient is on crizotinib and if has to fail, most of them did fail between third month and ninth month. And after 12th month, hardly anyone is continuing. But whatever patients are there after 12th month, continue to do good on crizotinib. This is where the long-term 22 months or 28 months of data is seen. But if you look at the lower Latin name, it gets stabilized anywhere between 12 to 15 months. And almost 70% of the patients are continuing to receive and in remission. So that's what is a beauty, that's what the graphs tell. PFS by the investigators is very similar to the independent review. So you can trust that there is no element of bias. In which subgroups it is having advantage? Presence of brain metastasis, yes. Ethnic Asians and non-Asians. It is having equally superior, but for non-Asians, slightly lower Latin is more better than Asians. ECOG 01, yes. Male and female, equally good. Age, independent, this, uh, this thing, less than 65, it works even better. Smoking, never smokers have slightly better advantage. So if I have to sum up, the never smokers and non-Asians have slightly superior Hello, I can see some background voice. Yeah, yeah, just excuse me, Dr. Vindhyavas, you have to mute yourself. Please mute it. Or supporting, please mute him. So if you look at the ORR by blinded independent review, so complete remission was achieved in close to 3% of the patients. Partial response is seen in 73% of the cases and stable disease in 13% of the cases. Progressive disease in 7% and 3% non-evaluable. So to say 90% of the patients and above have clinically meaningful response. 
intracranial objective responsiveness. That's what actually is more interesting. Is sixty-six percent with lower latinum compared to only twenty percent with this. This latinum also does have some penetration, but not as uh, great as lower latinum. If you look at CR complete remission rate, this is what actually I was trying to draw your attention. Sixty-one percent complete remission. So, do we really need to treat CNS with radiotherapy? Is a big question. That is a big debate. Uh, I would love to participate in that. Right? Patient with measurable brain metastasis at baseline. Again, seventy-one percent CR. That's a beauty. So, if you look at the intracranial time to progression, none of the patients on lorlatinibab. Had any further dip, they continued beyond 33 months. So that's the beauty. So the patients are taking lorlatinib, no progression on the brain. How long? It is 33 months plus. And crizotinib have a fall as expected anywhere between third month to 18th month. But those who continue to respond with crizotinib also continue to respond. So if I start on lorlatinib. Probably I need not change the drug at all. So for CNS meds, upfront my choice is lorlatinib. Otherwise, crizotinib is a good choice. Yeah. Overall survival, great with lorlatinib as well. And if you look at the tolerability, quite well tolerated. Seven percent is adverse events leading to permanent discontinuation compared to nine percent in crizotinib. So what are the side effects? If you look at lorlatinib. Causes more of a lipid abnormalities and CNS cognitive abnormalities. Remaining are adverse events are more common with crizotinib, like GI and liver abnormalities are more common with crizotinib. So this is how the graph looks like: the hypercholesterolemia, hyperglycemia, edema, and other things are more common with lower level. Change in the quality of life. Between crizotinib and lorlatinib, lorlatinib is having better improvement in the quality of life compared to the crizotinib. So let's see what happens after 36 months. We have analyzed 18 months data. At the end of 36 months, also close to close to two thirds of the patients with lorlatinib are continue to do well compared to only around 20 percent. So there is no big difference after two years. Those who are doing good. At end of two years, continue to do good, at, even after the end of three years also. That's the conclusion. So again, uh, a subgroup analysis which was planned, it shows that even at the end of thirty-six months, all groups fared very well. So if you look at the patients with brain metastasis, at the end of close to eighteen months, there is a slight dip, but. After the dip, lorlatinib continued to have CR, and without brain metastasis, it is slightly superior. Time to intracranial progression is significantly longer with lorlatinib compared to crizotinib, as expected. Even in the independent review, it showed the same. So patients without brain metastasis to start with, and with brain metastasis, there is no difference. They continue to do great. The summary of overall and intracranial responses says that confirmed objective response rates is seventy-seven percent, CR rate is two percent. Patients with any brain metastasis at baseline, confirmed intracranial objective response rate is around seventy percent, and complete uh, intracranial response is sixty percent with lorlatinib, compared to hardly ten to fifteen percent with crizotinib. Is it safe? Yes, it is safe. At the end of 36 months, also there is no change in the safety profile. So long-term use is not determined. A is leading to permanent treatment discontinuation is seven percent in both the arms. At at the end of eight months and at the end of 36 months. So if the patient does good at the end of 18 months, they tend to good even at the end of 36 months. So to conclude, with approximately 18 months of additional follow-up since the entry analysis of the Phase three crown study, lorlatinib continued to show superior overall survival and intracranial efficacy compared to other TKIs, especially crizotinib. PFS is better. Time to intracranial progression was longer. Efficacy benefits with lorlatinib compared to crizotinib is observed 
not only in the patients with brain and metastasis, but also without brain metastasis. The new safety signals were observed with long-term follow-up. So if a patient takes well <coughs> at the end of 18 months, they continue to do well at the end of 36 months also. So this is the basis for 2022 recommendations. The preferred drug is either electinib, brigadinib, or lorlatinib. In my practice, if the patient is affordable, I prefer lorlatinib. Otherwise, serotinib or prisotinib are the choices. How to manage the side effects? Last few slides. Hyperlipidemia. Please choose a drug that doesn't have interaction with the CVP450. So the recommendation is rosuvastatin, which is widely available in India, or pravastatin or pitavastatin, rarely used. Make patients aware about the regular monitoring. Do it at the end of first month, second month. If they do well, then unlikely they do, they do have long-term side effects. Otherwise, they do have some side effects. Major, major issue which we want to focus is CNS side effects. They include change in the cognitive function. People started behaving uh, erratically. They may become aggressive. They may be forgetful. The moods will fluctuate. The speech will be slurred. There is a lag between your question and the answer. Sometimes it is irrelevant. They can be very mild to very severe. Six out of my 12 patients do have some form of CNS effects. It's tough sometimes to handle that. So the frequency is 39%. In my practice, close to 50%. And 20% experiencing more than one type of CNS effect. The problem is they do have brain meds also. That complicates the picture even more. So what to do? If it is grade one, continue the same dose. Or withhold the dose until recovery happens. Rechallenge at one dose lower. If it is grade two, that is moderate to severe, Withhold unless it becomes less than grade one and rechallenge with one dose lower. Grade four never is start. So this is how we manage. If any questions are there, I have two minutes to answer that. If there are no questions, over to the organizers. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk. Anyone has any questions? So, sir, can take up. So thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Suresh, for such a brilliant presentation and well on time. So, Dr. Venugopal, sir, any questions for Dr. Suresh? We still have a couple of minutes. Yeah. So that was a great talk uh, by Suresh, sir. Actually, the drug lorlatinib, you know, it has given uh, impressive CNS disease control rates. So if you look at the intracranial overall response rates, it's in the range of 82%, whereas it, uh, with crizotinib, it's only in the range of 20%. And... Definitely one-year PFS rates are also amazing. HR uh, being uh, one-year PFS, hazards being only 0.28, best among the available agents. And definitely we have to avoid for uh, overall survival data to compare which one is the best among the available agents uh, right now when we compare, especially with electinib. As you rightly pointed out, sir, uh, the neurocognitive effects are the one which we should not forget because, you know, it uh, ranges from a gamut of asymptomatic patients to lack of concentration, lack of attention to serious toxicities like seizures, confusional state, all that. So we need to be you know, educating our patients regarding that because it is reversible and uh, if we were with the dose reduction. So appropriately, if we are able to reduce the doses appropriately at right point of time, I think uh, we can avoid serious CNS toxicities other than that, I think Sir has covered everything. With that, we'll move on to the next topic. When we just adding to your last thing, so while I told you most of the things about lorlatinib, I do have enough experience with the crizotinib and uh, other drugs as well. But their cardiotoxic and rhythm disturbances are really troubling. We hardly monitor them. True. So in the yeah. similar way, these CNS effects also, most of right. the time I was going through the literature. So do you have any giddiness? Do you feel tipsy, tawy? They tell no. But unless sometimes if you probe them, yes, sir, I have some confusion, some right. relevant, uh, irrelevant speech sometimes on and off. So we need right. to really be careful, I guess. Right, right. So, right. so thank you very much. I'll put myself on mute. Thank you. Thank you. So Ekta, can you invite the next speaker, please? Sure. So, uh, for our next talk, I would like to invite Dr. Krupa Shankar, who is Senior Consultant Medical Oncologist, NSR Coimbatore, and he is going to deliver his talk on optimal sequencing 
of ALP TKI in ALP plus MNSCNC. Over to you, sir. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for those kind words. I'll just share my screen and we'll get started. Well, I hope my slides are visible and I'm on. Yes, sir. Very good. So very good evening and a warm welcome to everyone. And at the outset, before I begin, I'm going to take this opportunity to thank the organizers and especially my good friend, Dr. Venu Gopal, for actually putting together this wonderful academic initiative and also thank them for the opportunity. So I'm for the next uh, 15 minutes or so, I'm going to take you through the optimal sequencing of tyrosine kinase inhibitors in ALK positive non smell cell lung cancer. I know we're right now, we're in the era where we're spoiled for choices in the first line setting. So how do you actually look at translating the available evidence in the, into clinical practice? And that's what I'm going to do today. So I know we've come a long way, right, from the early 2000s, from 2005, where ELK inhibitors actually entered clinical development to the current era, where we have all the ALK inhibitors that are approved in the first line, be it the first generation ALK inhibitors, Chrysotinib, second generation as well, being Electinib and uh, Brigatinib as well, and serotonin as well, or even the third generation alkemeter, which is lorlatinib, which is also now approved in the first line based on the crown data, which Dr. Suresh also rightly pointed out earlier. So this is just to put things in perspective. And you know, we have first generation ALK inhibitors, which were not only very specific to ALK, they had action on the ROS1 and MET as well. It's multi-kinase inhibitors, out of which Chrysotinib was a prime example. And then second generation was serotonin, electinib, pregatinib, and ensartinib. Brigadinum was unique, slightly unique in that it had action on the EGFR as well, especially in EGFR exon 19 DELs as well. And the third generation, the only other generation ALK inhibitor that is available to us currently, which is lorlatinib, and entrectinib, which is basically a GRK inhibitor or a tropomycin receptor kinase inhibitor, but also has activity on ALK as well. So let's just look at a host of phase three trials and how these actually came to being. So the earlier trials actually looked at comparing trizotinib versus chemotherapy. And you can see that the median PFS ranged from 11 months to around 16 months with serotonin. And with electinib, uh, I'll show you the updated data on the LX data as well, where we're looking at a median PFS of close to 35 months. So that's setting a new benchmark as far as median progression free survival in the first line is concerned. So this is how it came into being. And what I want to highlight here is if you look at all the trials, be it from the phase one study to phase two, being single agent chrysotinib and again against chemotherapy as well. So look at the response rates, well in excess of 60%. And the median PFS has ranged anywhere between eight to 11 months. So on an average, it's around 10 to 11 months PFS with your first generation ALK inhibitor, which is chrysotinib. And again, the adverse events are primarily visual disorders and GI adverse effects. So let's look at serotonin. And uh, this was the trial which led to the approval of serotonin at a dose of 750 milligrams earlier. And this, this was the earlier approved dose of serotonin before the current dosing of 450 milligrams with food, where we know that the bioavailability is just the same. So this was the trial looking at serotonin against chemotherapy again here, followed by maintenance pemetrexid. And uh, the, probably, you know, just a bit of baseline characteristics as far as this study was concerned. About one third of patients had baseline brain metastasis and around two thirds had not received any prior radiotherapy, meaning they had untreated brain metastasis. That's probably a significant factor because we know that serotonin has much better CNS penetration given that it's a second generation ALK inhibitor. So capable of producing, penetrating the blood brain barrier and also causing better CNS response rates. And this actually ended up doubling the median PFS 16 versus eight months, an absolute benefit of yeah, close to eight months with serotonin as opposed to chemotherapy. There you saw it was 11 months. Now, you know, it's, it's setting the bar a bit more higher at 16 months. So when you talk about ALK positive non-small cell lung cancer, we know that there are two different entities, patients who have brain metastasis and patients who don't present with brain metastasis. And we know that having an ALK positivity actually predisposes these patients to developing brain metastasis as well, which is why around 30% can present with brain metastasis. So the key thing with all these second generation and the third generation ALK inhibitors is that they have much better CNS penetration. And which is why you can see that the magnitude of benefit is preserved even in patients who have brain metastasis as opposed to no brain metastasis. It was 11 versus seven months in patients who have brain metastasis and 26 versus eight months in patients who don't have brain metastasis. This is uh, data on serotonin. And then you have the Asian subgroup analysis from the same SN4 data 
looking at again the median PFS, even if you look at patients, you know, the Asian subgroup analysis, 26 versus 10 marks, uh, or you're talking about hazard ratio of 0.66, 34% relative risk reduction. So let's look at the intracranial efficacy between just a cross trial comparison. And the key thing here to remember is that the intracranial response rates are well in excess of 70%, and the disease control rates in the intracranial, res in the intracranial responses to the tune of around 80% as opposed to around 50% with Trizor. And this is where probably seritinib scored over. And to put things in perspective, again, this is how it is. 11 months with Trizor, 16 months PFS, median PFS with seritinib in the first line, which much better CNS penetration as well. And this was the ASIN-8 data, which actually led to the approval of seritinib with 450 milligrams per day with a low fat meal, thereby enhancing on the bioavailability of the drug. So they looked at three different dosings, 450 milligrams, 600 and 750 milligrams. And as you can see here, nothing to choose from. The median PFS with 450 milligrams was on par with what was seen with 750 and even 600 or if not better. And the adverse events were also much lesser, meaning that it was much better tolerated when it was given at 450 milligrams with a low fat mean. And the chief uh, issues being the GI adverse effects were much lesser when you used it at 450 milligrams with food. So this was the early recommendation where you know you could start with 750 and then go down up to 300 milligrams as far as dose reduction is concerned. Now we can start off with 450 and go down to at least of 150 milligrams, depending on the tolerance or inside adverse effect profile of the patient. Moving on to electinib, and this was the data which led to the approval of electinib in the first line setting, the LX data. And by then, chrysotinib had become everybody's favorite whipping boy because all these ALK inhibitors had been compared against chrysotinib and proven to be better than chrysotinib. So I think here also the primary endpoint was a PFS, and this was the update on the PFS. So you can see here, 35 months versus 11 months. And as I had shown you earlier as well, you, your median was around 11 months with chrysotinib. And that seemed to be mirrored in the LX data as well. And the key, probably the most impressive thing is even in the presence of CNS metastasis, you had a PFS of close to 28 months. It was quadrupled, seven versus 28 months. I saw that was very, very intriguing and very impressive data indeed for electinib. And this was the uh, overall survival. Yes, well, it hasn't it completely matured and we, they haven't been actually be able to show a difference in the overall survival, but that's probably because they had access to uh, third generation ALK inhibitors in the second line setting as well. And even if you look at the time to see in this progression, uh, you can see that Electinib really did score over Prizoactin and probably which is why, you know, at that point in time, it became the preferred drug of choice in the first line setting for ALK positive non small cell lung cancer. And if you look at the safety profile as well, again, it was more of GI adverse events and the G, uh, the, even the GI adverse events of grade three and five were, were actually much lesser than Prizoactinib. So it seemed to be much better tolerated and much well tolerated as opposed to Prizoactinib. And then this was a study looking at it exclusively in patients of Asian ethnicity or Asian origin. And uh, so again, you know, this seemed to mirror the same magnitude of benefit that you'd seen on the LX study. And if you look at the intracranial response rates here as well, the CNS response rates. Well, I mean, like you, you could look at you could look at the numbers there. Ninety-four percent CNS overall response rates. So to me, that's like almost everybody who has brain metastasis are going to respond if you put them on lagnum. So I think that that to me is really you know to, to the tune of around ninety percent as opposed to close to eighty percent with prizoactinib tells me that this this is wonderfully this is a wonderfully designed drug to work, especially in patients with brain metastasis. And again, the grade three five adverse events, nothing much to choose from. Again, the GI adverse events. And even the heterotoxicity was absolutely negligible as, as opposed to chrysotinib. So I think this actually confirmed as to why electinib should be the first line standard of care, even in uh, Asian patients as well. And then came bregatinib, which is another second generation ALK inhibitor. The uniqueness being that it also inhibits EGFR, uh, especially exon 19 DELs as well. So if you have a compound mutation, somebody's got an EGFR and an ALK mutation, even though that's a rare uh, case scenario, you could probably be tempted towards using this drug. And uh, the other unique thing about uh, was the dosing. You had to use it at 90 milligram for one week and then escalate based on tolerance to 180 milligrams. And the reason for that being that pulmonary toxicity was an issue. So if you started off with 180 milligrams, the incidence of pulmonary toxicity was higher, which is why you had a lead in dosing of 90 milligrams for a week and then escalate to 180 milligrams. So again, like I said, this was also compared against chrysotinib and proved to be better than chrysotinib. Uh, so again, the median PFS wasn't reached here and with uh, chrysotinib was close to 10 months. So 10 to 11 months seems to be the benchmark as far as chrysotinib is concerned. 
And again, uh, the systemic and intracranial response rates much better with brigatinib as opposed to brisatinib. And that's again what we've seen from the earlier data as well as far as second generation alkyl inhibitors are concerned. And as far as the safety was concerned, pneumonitis will definitely be an issue. But then again, if you started off with 90 milligrams and then escalated, the incidence of pneumonitis also seemed to come down. So I, I think that that was in, in effect, it was it, that was all made it a much tolerable drug as well. And I'm not going to get into the details of this study because uh, we've already heard Dr. Suresh talk about uh, the crown data. So again, now, you know, this also uh, led to the approval of lorlatinib in the first line setting. And um, again, very impressive, the PFS data, the magnitude of benefit. If you look at the hazard ratios, I mean, like, especially in the CNS progression, 0.07, I don't know, I remember the, when was the last time I even saw such an impressive hazard ratio. You're talking about a 93% relative risk reduction. And the overall survival data, again, is not yet mature. So we'll have to wait on that. And the key adverse events with lorlatinib, as was rightly pointed out, lip, dyslipidemia, weight gain, neuropathy and cognitive effects. So those seem to be the ad major adverse effects with lorlatinib. So let's look uh, quickly at a comparison of the efficacy. I know these are only cross-trial comparisons, but given that we don't have any head-to-head -head comparison between second generation or second versus third generation algae inhibitors, this is the best that's available to us at the time. So we can see that uh, the electinib data, median PFS of 35 months with brigatinib and lorlatinib, we don't have a median yet. So I think, you know, uh, uh, definitely, uh, you know, is, is it, is it uh, you know, the end of the road for chrysotinib? Well, I, I think so, unless and until the patient has significant international constraints. But anyway, let's get to that a little bit later on during the course of my talk as well, and I'll let you know. So uh, how do you then choose? I mean, like, can you choose based on the side effect profile or the toxicity profile as well? Yeah. So with, with chrysotinib, it seems to be more of visual disorders and edema. And with the second generation alkyl inhibitors, it seems to be more of the GI adverse effects. So, uh, you know, just to put things in perspective, that's one way of selecting as well. I think we've come a long way. And my uh, colleague, Dr. Suresh, also pointed out the uh, changing paradigm as far as the NCC and guidelines are concerned. So we've, we've more come a long way from 2016 to 2018 and to the current era where we now know both electionem and lorlatinib also is a category one recommendation, brigatinib and serotonin as well. All of them are uh, category one recommendations, but the preferred options being electionem and lorlatinib. So uh, let's look at how patients actually go on to develop a resistance and what are the patterns of progression? You know, we always talk, keep talking about oligo progression, or you know, oligo recurrence, oligo persistence, and it, it could be either a CNS oligo progression or it could be even extracranial oligo progression as well. So the reasons as to why that happens are obviously you have all you know the alternate signaling pathways being amplified, like the EGFR signaling pathways, or there could be a gain in the copy number or kinase domain mutations as well, which I'll add you to a little bit later on as well. And last but not least, you have epithelial mesenchymal transition which actually promotes invasion and metastasis as well. So um, this is just an overview of the most common mutations that can actually happen. The G1202R mutation is predominantly, you know, is very well known, it's been characterized well as well because that is a mutation which basically confers resistance to all of the second generation alkyl inhibitors. Only lorlatinib is active in that particular mutation, the G1202R. So that's becoming more like the T790M mutation. And then you have uh, mutations like the W171T mutation, which is resistant to electinib. I'll show you that a bit. I'll talk about a little, little, little bit later on as, I, as we go along as well. And again, if you look at the key issue uh, with prizotinib, look at the number of patients who went on to develop CNS metastasis. So that was CNS was the most common site of relapse in about 46% of patients. Almost 50% of patients failed in the CNS. And so when we look at brain metastasis after using uh, using a first generation alkyl inhibitor, so most of them tend to fail in the CNS, followed by the bone and liver in that order. So which is why you know you would need probably an alkyl inhibitor with with much better CNS activity capable of penetrating the blood brain barrier. So you know let's uh, let's talk about ad progression. What else can you do? Can you just con just continue chrysotinib beyond progression? Well, uh, doesn't seem to be a very attractive strategy. This is only a retrospective analysis uh, showing that as opposed to doing nothing or just putting them on best supportive care, it did show a benefit. But again, uh, not a great strategy. But if you do run out of options, yeah, probably worthwhile contemplating if your patient cannot afford any of the other alkyl inhibitors. But I think this is the data that was really impressive, the clean data or the lung map 
protocol, the master protocol, as we would call it, for al positive non sponsor lung cancer. Meaning, if you could actually sequence them ideally, look at that median overall survival of close to seven and a half years. But again, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't read too much into this data as well because this was also a retrospective analysis. And again, you will need a lot of things falling into place because you're banking on the patient not developing a resistant mutation. And also you're banking on the fact that the patient remains in good performance status and is, does go on to receive second, third line treatment as well. So there are a lot of things that are actually being taken into account here. So let's look at what happens if you, somebody, you know, starts on presartinibid, presartinibid refractory patients, what do you do? And let's look at the activity of serotonin. So uh, the response rates are to the tune of around 40 to 50%. And again, median PFS of around seven months and OS of, OS of around 16 months. So what about electinib in that, uh, in patients who are resistant to grizartinib? Again, the response rates to the tune of around 50%, duration of response close to a year, and uh, median PFS of close to eight to nine months. What about brigatinib then? Uh, well, again, if you look at, you know, this also, uh, you know, even when you use the escalation of 90 milligrams for one week followed by 180 milligrams, the median PFS was around 15 months, and the median overall survival of close to two years, or 27 months to be exact. So, you know, just, just to put things in perspective, and uh, again, if you look at, you know, this this just uh, cross cell comparisons between serotonin, electinib, and brigatinib in patients who have progressed or who become re refractory to prizatinib, the response rates seem to range between 50 to 60 percent with the median PFS ranging from 8 to 16 months. And uh, so that's the best possible options that we have. So what happens when you actually start on first lane second generation alk inhibitor like electinib? What or do you have a role for any of the second generation alk inhibitors? Well, again, uh, if you look at it here, the response rates aren't that impressive. We're talking about a response rates of only around 15 to 20 percent, median PFS of only around four months. So then what happens? So how about lorlatinib post electric? Can you do that as well? So this was again phase one by two data. And the median PFS here ranged from around 13 months if the patient has been, just had one prior LTK and even nine months, even if they've had two prior LTKs, which is why probably lorlatinib is a you know, is a, is a very good option in the second line setting. And I'll show you that as to why I'm saying that as I move along as well. Again, the key toxicities, dyslipidemia, edemia, neuropathy, and cognitive effects seem to be the major issues. And again, uh, just to summarize this, uh, as far as the activity, CNS activity post prizartinib well, even in patients who had uh, close to two-thirds of patients with brain metastasis at baseline, you can see that electinib, it did seem to score over as far as uh, having a response rate to the tune of around 60%, whereas lorlatinib also didn't seem to do the, that badly either, a, a response rates of around 50%. So um, again, that's how the uh, NCCN guidelines also changed, reflecting what's happened and what's happening now. So we know for oligo progression, you, you're, you're justified in actually doing local therapy and then continuing with the same ALK inhibitor as well. But if, if you have extracranial progression, then you, know, uh, you definitely have to look at switching therapy. And again, uh, I, I think you know, now the thing is lorlatinib has now become a op preferred option in the second line setting if somebody's got multiple lesions. And I'll, I'll just show you as to why that is so as we move along. So how do you actually look at optimally sequencing these alk inhibitors? Is it like a long distance relay race? Is it like a marathon? Absolutely, yes. Even, so, even more so in the Indian context. And so the first runner definitely is very important. So um, again, if, if, if the cost is not a constraint, the patient can afford it. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, you would go with a second or a third generation alk inhibitor in the first line setting. And probably electinib would be my choice as well. And I'll tell you why I'm saying that. Because you are, you're getting a median PFS of around close to 35 months and even 25 months, even in patients who have brain metastasis. Stunning. So uh, I think, you know, the other key issue probably would be that if you start off with a second generation alk inhibitor, the resistance mutations appear to be much more commoner, especially the G1202R mutation and the L1196. G1202R mutation is probably unique. My apologies, sir. You are just left with one minute to conclude. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll wind up. No issues. And again, uh, L1196 mutation as well, which confers resistance to electinib. So like I said earlier, this is probably one of the reasons as to why I would prefer using lorlatinib in the second line setting, because ideally it will be difficult for us to do a, a biopsy and progression for all patients. And which is why... And lorlatinib, as you can see here, is active against all of these resistant mutations. And that's why probably, you know, lorlatinib fits the bill for an ideal second generation TKI or the second line TKI. So ideally, yes, you would want to consider a rebiopsy, but most often than not, you may not actually be end up doing it. Liquid biopsies, yeah, are good. But then again, you may not get 
the ideal uh, resistant mutation that you're actually looking for. So uh, points to uh, consider, uh, definitely superior efficacy in the first line, why? because not, not all of our patients are going to go on to receive second line and the presence of brain metastasis also will go ahead and influencing our decision. And uh, again, symptomatic disease, obviously you're looking at higher response rates and second line options, I think, you know, that's where a lot of to me fits the bill. So let's be practical. What proportion of our patients actually go on to receive second generation TKIs? I think in the setting of a clinical trial, also 50 to 70 percent, but in real life, probably 50 percent, especially those who have brain metastasis at, at presentation, which is around 30 percent, like I said earlier. And in practice, how many actually undergo re biopsy and mutation testing? And what percentage can actually afford the second generation or the third generation ARC inhibitors? So I think, you know, uh, to you know to summarize, I would say it's just not one line. It's like a marathon. So if your patient can't afford any of these expensive agents, the second or the third generation alpha inhibitors, you're justified in doing the sequencing strategy as well. And this is how it looks like right now. So yeah, ideally, electinib in the first line followed by lorlatinib in the second line seems to be the ideal way to sequence. So I'm just going to, uh, this is my conclusion slide. So I know I've shown you the data for all these, uh, the first, second, and the third generation ALK inhibitors in the first line setting and how the, that's led to their approval as well. There is definitely an unmet need for better CNS penetration, which is why second and third generation ALK inhibitors have now come into the market and have been approved as well. And Prizotinib seems to be everybody's favorite whipping boy because all of these drugs have been compared against Prizotinib and found to be better as well. And Lorlatinib would be my drug of choice in the second line setting, given that it's active against all the resistant mutations, including the G1202R mutation. So with that, I'll conclude and uh, say thank you all for your patient listening and hand it over back to the organizers and Dr. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for the excellent presentation. And uh, I would like to like, uh, Dr. Venugopal, please, your comments, please. Yeah. Hi. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah. So as usually, that was a great talk by Dr. Krupa. So the, a couple of questions, uh, Krupa. One is, uh, see, we have, we know that uh, we have we have fifty percent chance of uh, failing in uh, brain when we use uh, seritib or crizotinib. So how frequently do we do MRI brain? One. Second one is, see, we know that we have uh, financial constraints for most of our patients. So given a choice, uh, let us take it as no financial constraints your take between uh, electinib and uh, lorlatinib on a clinical day-to-day uh, -day practice basis, yeah. Perfect. So, you know, I'll probably take your, your, your second question first and then <laughs> get to the first question as well, you know. So, uh, you know, uh, given a choice and if my patient can afford anything, I would definitely look at using probably electinib in the first line setting. And the reason why I say that is probably because, you know, I know probably lorlatinib is effective even in the second line setting, post-progression on electinib as well. And even if the patient, you know, develops a resistant mutation, like let's say, for example, the G1202R mutation as well, lorlatinib is going to be active in that setting as well. And that's the rationale. And that's why I said I prefer doing electinib followed by lorlatinib in the real world, in clinical practice as well, given that the patient doesn't have any financial constraints. And as far as your, uh, your you know, the earlier question, the first question, okay, okay, <laughs> that's fine. So, uh, so uh, you know, as far as the MRI is concerned, uh, you know, I, I usually insist on getting it done at baseline, but I don't, uh, you know, routinely do a uh, surveillance MRI, you know, let's say around three months. No, I don't do that. I only do it if the patient is symptomatic, you know, in practice. So, you know, that's how I would do it. Yeah, ideally, even if you do a PET CT at baseline, you, you justified in asking for an MRI at baseline, but I don't regularly do a surveillance MRI in practice. I only do do so if the patient's got any symptoms of CNS metastasis, then I do an MRI. Yeah, oh, I completely, yeah. Yeah, I completely echo with whatever you said uh, for my couple of questions. So these rare, rare mutations like G120R, so these rarer mutations at baseline, apart from ALK fusion uh, kinase domain mutation, they are really very rare. So I think lorlatinib can be reserved for the later usage after the prior exposure of the other TKIs. And uh, so the very, very, uh, very positive of data regarding the MRI brain, I think uh, in the literature, it was mentioned that if feasibility is there, every three monthly is uh, one anecdotal, uh, that's what is uh, I come across with that. Right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So next, I would like to invite Dr. Deepak Pratika, who is Senior Consultant Medical Oncologist, Care Hospital, Hyderabad, and he's going to talk on 
redefining survival expectations in MNSCLC. Keynote 189 and 400. Over to us. Yeah, hi. Uh, at the onset, I would like to thank the organizers and in particular my senior, Dr. Venusa, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so I'll be discussing about redefining survival expectations in NSCLC. And uh, we've all come across a scenario where we see our lung cancer patients now living long. Most often uh, than not, it's because of our uh, TKIs and with in, uh, advent of immunotherapy in the management of these patients. Uh, post two years of uh, immunotherapy, how do these patients fare is uh, something which I would like to explore uh, and discuss over the next few minutes. Uh, so any slide... Uh, or any presentation with lung cancer starts with this wonderful uh, cartoon describing about how we move forward in this disease, uh, wherein it started as one disease and later we had squamous, adeno, small cells, and then adeno is now um, having multiple subtypes with more than 50% of adeno is now uh, going on targeted therapy in practice uh, and the remaining 40% where uh, we do not have a targeted therapy available uh, or uh, the target therapy not uh, or no uh, harboring no uh, mutations, we end up giving immunotherapy with or without chemotherapy. So I'll be predominantly discussing about the role of combination uh, immunotherapy with chemotherapy, taking our uh, two clinical trials into consideration initially, that is uh, the Keynote 189, which uh, enrolled non-squamous, non-small cell carcinoma lung, and the Keynote 407, which predominantly enrolled the squamous cell carcinoma lung. And then uh, how do patients who complete two years of uh, TKI fare and what are the survival rates and what can we look up to in these group of patients? Uh, slightly touching upon uh, the Keynote 21 study also. Um, and later in, in a small, in, in a significant fraction, not a small, pardon me for that, uh, in around uh, patients who, ha who have PDL1 less than 1%, how do we go about uh, with the use of uh, immunotherapy in combination with chemotherapy? So as we all know, uh, Unlike the conventional chemotherapeutic agents, immunotherapy is not focused on the cancer cell per se, but it facilitates the recognition of cancer cells by our own immune system. And by stimulating the immune system, the cancer, uh, we control the cancer by predominantly stimulating the immune system. The, the toxicity profile is different. And most often after the immune system becomes over enthusiastic, uh, we see uh, autoimmune side effects, which can affect any organ in the body. A side effect which is uh, significantly different from what we see uh, with conventional chemotherapies or targeted therapies. And significantly, the long-term survival is 20 to 30%. And this is what uh, has really brought in great interest in uh, uh, incorporating this agent into our clinical practice. Uh, so as we all know, uh, you uh, there are two kinds of tumors which are uh, inherently cold tumors or tumors which are inherently hot or cold tumors with advent of with introduction of chemotherapy or radiotherapy can sometimes be turned into hot tumors and uh, patient and in patients who, ha who have high pdl1 sensitivity uh, immunotherapy alone can be sufficient and in patients or, or in tumors which are uh, inherently cold we can induce a hot uh, we can convert them into a hot tumor by uh, uh, either extrinsic agents like uh, chemotherapy or radiotherapy or uh, newer molecules. Uh, and on top of it, addition of immunotherapy uh, increases the immune T cell uh, stimulation. Now, that is the rationale for adding immunotherapy to chemotherapy. And uh, this is the uh, first phase three study uh, evaluating uh, immunotherapy plus chemotherapy, non squamous NSCLC, that is a Keynote 189 study. So it's a placebo control study where uh, two is to one, around 600 uh, patients were enrolled uh, into a two and randomized into two is to one uh, fashion between pembrolizumab and the standard of care chemotherapy for non squamous non small cell carcinoma, that is pemetrexate and carboplatin or cisplatin, uh, followed by pemetrexate pembrolizumab maintenance uh, 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 and uh, in the placebo, it was pemetrexate carboplatin or cisplatin and then pemetrexate maintenance alone. So uh, patients uh, were enrolled if they had CNS metastasis, but not symptomatic CNS metastasis. Asymptomatic CNS metastasis patients were allowed. Uh, EGFR and ALK mutations, uh, patients were not enrolled in this study. Um, uh, the stratification factors were uh, PDL1 less than 1% or more than uh, 1%. And further postdoc analysis, they included patients harboring more than PDL1 uh, 50% also to assess the benefit uh, 
or the benefit which was predominantly uh, whether it was the pdl one more than 50 percent uh, uh, pulling the curve uh, in the overall population uh, cisplatin versus carboplatin and smoking status were also the stratification factors and the primary endpoint of the study was pfs and os so two uh, co-primary endpoints were the uh, primary endpoints in the study so uh, brain metastasis was seen in around 17% uh, of the patients and they were asymptomatic brain metastasis. Around 30% of the patients were PDL1 negative or the TPS score was less than 1%. Uh, around 25 to 30% patients received cisplatin. Uh, liver metastasis were seen in 16% of the patients. And uh, uh, so this was the uh, uh, updated uh, four-year PFS. Uh, the there was a doubling of PFS uh, with the addition of pembrolizumab, 4.9 months were, uh, versus nine months, and the hazard ratio was 50 percent, 0.5, 50 percent risk reduction in progression was seen. Uh, at three years, only one person of the patient in uh, the uh, uh, in the chemotherapy arm uh, were uh, did not have any progression compared to 11 percent in the patients with the arm which received pembrolizumab in along, in addition with chemotherapy. So, yeah. so a significant benefit was seen in all group of patients uh, 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 in the uh, with the addition of pembrolizumab to chemotherapy. And now coming to the OS, uh, uh, there was literally a doubling of OS also seen. Ten point six months versus twenty two months, and a forty percent risk reduction in uh, uh, overalls uh, in uh, uh, death risk reduction of death was seen. And at three years, a doubling, a near doubling was seen in the overall survival. Seventeen months versus thirty one months. Uh, now coming to uh, the stratification, uh, in the maximum benefit again was seen in patients where the TPS score was more than 50%, uh, 10 months versus 27.7 uh, months, uh, whereas uh, in patients between 1 to 49%, uh, 12 months versus 21 months uh, was seen. In patients where TPS was less than 1%, even in this group, there was a significant improvement in overall survival. That was 10 months versus 17.2 months. But uh, almost uh, an additional 10-month improvement in overall survival was seen in the PEMBRO arm in patients who had TPS more than 50% compared to patients who were uh, PDL1 negative. Um, Coming to patients receiving subsequent line of treatment and PFS2 when, when it was assessed, again, the patients who received immunotherapy, they fared much better than patients who received immunotherapy in subsequent lines of treatment. In the study, around 40% uh, of the patients in subsequent lines were exposed to immunotherapy. But when introduced in the second line, the benefit of immunotherapy is uh, not that great uh, than, when it, than when exposed in the first line. So th the PFS2 uh, curve again shows that in patients who received pembrolizumab in the first line and then received subsequent agents. That was around 13% of the patients received again immunotherapy, but uh, compared to 40% in patients who were uh, in the chemotherapy arm in the second line received immunotherapy. But in spite of that, a significant improvement in PFS was seen. PFS2 was seen in patients who received uh, pembrolizumab in the first line setting. So the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the inference here is if a patient is uh, suitable for immunotherapy and affordable for immunotherapy, pushing immunotherapy in the first line is of paramount importance because even when exposed in the second line, the PFS in this group of patients is not significant. So almost a double, uh, doubling of PFS was seen again in this group, nine months versus 17 months, and the hazard ratio is 0.52. Again, uh, the benefit, the predominant benefit is seen in patients who had PDL1 more than 50% who had sustained uh, a benefit from uh, pembrolizumab as seen in this study compared to patients with PDL1 less than uh, 1%. The duration of response again, uh, the overall response rates were higher in PDL1 more than 50% compared to 33% uh, uh, in patients who had PDL1. Uh, TPS score less than 1%. Similarly, the uh, duration of response was 15 months versus 10 months com when, com when compared to PDL1 more than 50% versus less than 1%. So the bottom line here is uh, in spite of adding chemotherapy to immunotherapy, maximum benefit uh, and the maximum duration of response or the PFS2 advantage is predominantly seen in patients having PDL1 more than 50%. In, but when compared to chemotherapy alone, the addition of immunotherapy has significantly improved uh, the duration of response and also the overall response rates in patients having TPS less than 1%.
So now coming to what happens to these patients after two years of treatment. So uh, 40% of the patients crossed over to pembrolizumab, like I've discussed. Uh, around uh, out of the 600 patients, around 400 patients who received pembrolizumab, 56 pa patients uh, received two years of uh, pembrolizumab. That is, they've completed the due course of pembrolizumab pemetrix in maintenance and were on observation. And at the end of one year, 94.6% of the patients were alive. That is at three years, 94.6% of the patients are alive uh, after they've completed the two-year treatment. Now, the updated analysis, that is after two years after they completed two years of pembrolizumab, around 80% uh, of the patients were alive or 10% uh, mortality was seen uh, from post-completion of treatment, that is one year to post-completion of treatment, two years. Uh, so a uh, few patients were rechallenged with pembrolizumab. Two patients had stable disease as their uh, best response. Compla uh, and two, two patients had progressive disease as their best response. So yeah, this was 40.8% patients uh, were crossed over. And if taken as per uh, intention to treat analysis, 53.9% patients, there was a crossover seen. Uh, in the PEMRO arm, in the second line, around 13% of the patient, like discussed earlier, received sub subsequent uh, immunotherapeutic agent. Uh, the toxic T profile, uh, we've seen that uh, uh, treatment discontinuation is seen uh, uh, higher in patients who received chemoimmuno because we are adding additional agents with chemotherapy. 27% discontinuation was seen, but uh, death, relate, uh, death related to the addition of treatment is not statistically significant. So the takeaways from the Keynote 189 is with more than three years of follow-up, uh, pembrolizumab plus pemetrexate platin continue to improve OS and also PFS. And uh, the three-year OS is approximately doubled with the addition of pembrolizumab to chemotherapy. And the benefit uh, is seen irrespective of PD-1 expression, but we can see that patient, with patients who harbor more than 50% pd one expression, uh, the benefit is uh, even higher than patients having pd one uh, less than 1%. So patients who received 35 cycles of pembrolizumab, that is who completed two years, uh, around 90% of the patients were alive at one year and 80% of the patients were alive at the end of two years post completion of treatment and the toxicity is uh, manageable. Now coming to the squamous cell population, uh, I would just like to briefly highlight the difference between the non-squamous and the squamous population here. Uh, even in this study, they've taken asymptomatic brain metastasis, a one is to one randomization between uh, pembrolizumab uh, in addition to paclitaxel or not paclitaxel with carboplatin. Cisplatin was not uh, allowed in the study uh, and were followed by pembrolizumab maintenance versus uh, placebo, uh, carboplatin, napacli or paclitaxel and saline maintenance. Uh, were uh, stratified into one is to one based on PDL1 expression, that is PDL1 less than one person or more than one person. In this study, I was not able to find references for more than 50% to see what was the major uh, factor which was driving benefit. The choice of ta taxin, paclitaxel versus nap paclitaxel and uh, region were the stratification factors. Paclitaxel when used, the dose of 200 milligram per meter square was used and nampaclitaxel on a weekly dose of 100 milligram per meter square was used in the study. The primary endpoint was PFS and no co uh, primary endpoint, uh, two uh, co-primary endpoints that is PFS and OS were the uh, endpoints in this study. Um, and again, stable brain metastasis in squamous, relatively fewer patients present with uh, de novo brain metastasis. This is 7% in contrast to 20%, which was seen in adeno adenocarcinoma patients in the previous study. And uh, again, around 30 to 33% of the pa 34 uh, patients here had PDL1 less than 1%. And around 37% uh, patient uh, uh, were in the 1 to 49 group and 26, 25%, one four of the patients had PDL1 more than 50%. And around 60% of the patients had paclitaxel as their drug of choice. Now, the PFS here, again, uh, near doubling of PFS was seen from five months versus eight months. And uh, risk reduction of progression of around 43% was seen uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.57. Uh, again, the median overall survival uh, was 11 months versus 17 months. A nearly six-month improvement, improvement in absolute median overall survival was seen. And a 30% risk reduction of death was seen uh, with the addition of pembrolizumab to conventional chemotherapy. Uh, now coming to patients who were PDL1 less than 1%. Uh, though, uh, in the subset analysis, uh, the median uh, OS was numerically higher, 15 months versus 11 months in uh, patients with PDL1 less than 1% compared to 12 months versus 18.9 months. 
which was with a hazard ratio of 0.67, which was statistically significant. Uh, again, uh, the PFS2, again, as discussed earlier, if immunotherapy uh, showed sustained benefit, even in second line after patients progressed and received other agents around uh, uh, the median uh, PFS was 13.8 months versus 9.1 months uh, uh, in this study. So again, uh, irrespective of the histology, if immunotherapy needs to be introduced, it's better to introduce these agents in the first line rather than in the second line. Again, this benefit was uh, predominantly seen in uh, patients uh, with, with PDL1 more than uh, 1% in this study. Now, coming to uh, uh, the patients who completed two years of treatment at uh, one year post completion of uh, 35 cycles of two years of pembrolizumab, uh, uh, oh, uh, it, it was seen that uh, one second, uh, around 86% of the patients were alive. Uh, around a significant proportion that is nearly again 92% of the patients were alive post progression and only one person one one patient uh, sorry only two patients had death uh, as uh, after completion of treatment adverse events were uh, more or less uh, again seen that more number of patients who received pembro chemo combination had more adverse events and discontinuation rates uh, were uh, almost double in patients where immunotherapy was added to chemotherapy uh, key takeaways were uh, uh, at three years of follow-up, pembrolizumab uh, in combination with chemotherapy, there was a significant OS and PFS advantage, and this was seen irrespective of PDL1 expression. Most patients who completed 35 cycles of pembrolizumab had CR and were alive without progressive disease at data cutoff point. So this, this is the uh, uh, chart which I would like to uh, list. That is the Keynote 24, uh, which has the best results with immunotherapy with single agent pembrolizumab in comparison to um, uh, key, single agent pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy in patients having pdl1 more than 50 percent they have shown the, the highest pfs uh, and the os data so far uh, uh, but again in this the pfs2 in all studies they favored immunotherapy in the first line patients who received immunotherapy in the first line even the pfs2 uh, the keynote 24 is, has the highest PFS2 in the patient with the immunotherapy arm, pembrolizumab arm, that is 24 months versus... My eight. apologies, sir, just two minutes left. Yeah, yeah. so again, uh, so post one year of completion of treatment, all three arms, that is the Keynote 407, Keynote 24, and the Keynote 189, say that around 95% of the patients post one year of treatment are still alive after they have sustained response. And at two years, an iteration of 10% is seen. Uh, that is 87% of the patients in the Keynote 24 were alive versus 80% in the Keynote 189. And at three years, 81% or 5% further iteration is seen uh, in the Keynote 24. We do not have an updated analysis at three years. That is five years from the start of, uh, from the end of, uh, oh, sorry, from the start of enrollment. We do not have data both for the Keynote 407 or 189. But what I would like to highlight here is patients who complete two years of pembrolizumab in these group of patients at five years, uh, we see that uh, around 80% of these patients are alive. And uh, uh, we, uh, so that's really promising. And we can see that uh, as, to, as discussed earlier, around 20 to 30% of the patients are alive with the use of these agents. Now coming to this small population, that is 30% of the patients where PDL1 expression is negative or less than 1%, we see that in comparison to chemotherapy, these patients fare better. The PFS is always not significantly greater, only a one month incremental PFS advantage is seen, but what significantly drives the benefit is the PFS2, that is patient, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the PFS2, where patients post progression on immunotherapy, they have the sustained benefit with immunotherapy, and this results in an improvement in overall survival. That though uh, only one month improvement, incremental improvement in PFS is seen, an eight month in incremental improvement in overall survival is seen with the addition of immunotherapy, even in this population. So, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you so much for the excellent presentation. And uh, I would like to invite Dr. Venu Gupal for the expert comments. Yeah, uh, very nice talk uh, by Dr. Deepak. So basically, Deepak, uh, I have one question for you. See, we have seen, uh, you know, irrespective of in Keynote 189, so we have seen OS benefit was seen across uh, all PDL1 positive or negative subsets, right? Uh, with the medians in the range of uh, 
22 months with hazards of 0.60. Yes, sir. And yes, sir. even uh, PDL1 negative, that is less than 1%, also phenomenal hazards in the range of 0.52. But yes, whereas, uh, you know, not uh, the similar one in the case of 407, farmer's histology, PDL1 yes, hazards are in the range of, range of uh, you know, 0 0.79, 0 0.80, where we are not comfortable. So yeah. in Adeno, uh, for uh, any subgroup like PDL1 positive or negative, is it Pembro for uh, Pembro plus chemo for all, or what is your take on that? So uh, again, uh, most uh, Adenos, uh, I would uh, uh, I would go with Pembro plus uh, chemotherapy plus minus chemotherapy. Uh, in PDL1, more than fifty percent. Again, I would factor in additional factors like smoking history and the sex of the patient. Uh, in patients who are non-smokers or in females. I tend to use a chemo plus uh, immunocombination, predominantly in non-smokers. Uh, in a very small fraction of patients where PDL1 is more than 90%, there is a significant benefit with single agent immunotherapy, and the benefit of incremental benefit of adding chemotherapy is not great in that population. But in patients with PDL1 more than 50% who are non-smokers, I tend to use um, chemo plus immuno or other patients who are more than 51 50 pdl1 50 percent pdl1 expression and with uh, uh, with significant smoking history and in males i straight away go with single agent immunotherapy yeah good and one more uh, paradoxical thing what we see see this commercial histology is associated with smoking and smoking is, smokers are expected to have you know good amount of new antigens where we expect good amounts of response with ivo but yes. not just in 407, in any study, farmer's histology didn't fare that better with, uh, you know, IVO yes, therapy. Sir. Consistently, not only the chemo not arms. Just 407, yeah. Yes, sir. Not alone the IO arms in the study. If we compare the, uh, the chemotherapy, which is the standard of care arms in all these study, we see that they fare way less uh, than what than, uh, you know. See, and yeah. one, one possible reason what they explain is like a significant amount of comorbidities associated with a, a long history of smoking. Yeah. That's one uh, thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank yes. you. Thank you, sir. So next, I would like to invite our next speaker of today, Dr. Bharat Vaswani, who is Senior Consultant, Medical Oncologist, Yashoda Hospital, Sikandrava for his talk on role of dual IU therapy in the treatment of first time in MNCX. Over to you, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks, Venu. Are my slides visible? No, sir, not yet. You need to share your screen. Oh, one minute. Give me a minute. So, Now? Yes, sir. It's yeah. Yes, sir. So yes, sir. again, uh, uh, thanks to Venu, thanks to Deepak also, who has made my job at least somewhat easy to discuss. Something that I actually, thanks to Venu again for putting up that point of squamous cell, because that is where the crux of my presentation lies. So when I talk about dual IO, now on a Monday morning, we have three options, IO, IO plus chemo and IO plus IO. Now, what do you want to, what will you try to concentrate my, on my presentation are four things now. What is the improvement or what is the response of this drug in a squamous cell? Unfortunately, I am not allowed to make any slides, so I am presenting whatever sponsors have been given. What was the response of IOIO IO in those with a PDL1 of less than 1%? And when you remember your kidney data, Checkmate 214, do you start getting a tailing? Probably this is the most important take-home message. And I'll just try to put some points at three and four year and what was it in Keynote 189. And, and last but not the least is the least or a lesser of a immune-related side effect. So probably these are the things whenever I'll be concentrating, I'll be discussing this data. Should I use the IOIO in any of the subset with the impressive data of Keynote 189 and 407? Is there a role? And I think it is a good role. And Probably in those subset analysis of squamous and less than 1%, the hazard ratio was only 0.47, and these were the best data in squamous less than 1%. So probably the, where IO chemo may not do well is in those with a PDL1 of less than 1, it doesn't do well. Probably IO IO remains the effect, remains the same irrespective of whatever was your PDL1. So for non driver mutation, probably 
a very good option and maybe better than a IO chemo. So one minute. So my presentation is divided into unmet needs, a overview of the cycle of uh, cancer immune response, a small description of the data of the two, Checkmate 227, uh, I, uh, the data of Nevo plus IP at four years, probably this is important for tailing. Checkmate 9LA, a two year data. In fact, we had a three year data presented in this ESCO. I'll just put a word of that. And what are the take home messages from where you should start using a IO and a IO. So when I talk about advanced non small cell lung cancer, each of us will agree that the worst prognosis, because most of the cases are diagnosed in stage four with a five year survival of 5%. Probably when you look into the keynote 010024, probably in those with a PDL1 of more than 50% uh, probably a bit higher. So the most unmet need or more uh, need is to get more effective drugs, which gives you a better depth and a duration of response, ultimately translating into a increased long-term survival. Now we have approval of two IOIO, one based on checkmate 227. Please remember it was also PDL1 less than 1%, but the main primary endpoint was it had looked into those patients with a PDL1 of more than 1%. So this combination is approved, a combination of your up data and your work in a first line patient with a PDL1 of more than 1% in a non driver mutation. And checkmate 9A also in the same subset of patient, but irrespective of your PDL1 uh, percentage. So both of them have in the have approval in the first line setting in non driver mutation, non small cell lung cancer. If there are any PG or uh, DM student, most important slide when you uh, discuss about your immunotherapy. Step one, release of tumor antigen. These tumor antigens are then processed by dendritic cells. These dendritic cells then in the lymph node, if there is a, a, a anti-CTLA or if there is a CTLA, they don't activate T cells. But if it, there is a presence of anti-CTLA, there is a T cell priming activation and more importantly, the, the emergence of memory T cells. Now these T cells then go to the tumor, cause it goes inside the tumor and again, the role of PD-1. So if there is a presence of PD-1 binding with PD-L1 on tumor cell, the effector T cells response don't come. So if you have an anti-PD-L1, again, these activated T cells then kill tumor cells and also cause stimulation of cytokine, which we call as effective immune response. So as had been discussed in the previous slide, CTLA is expressed on T cells and has inhibit T cell activation. So the binding to dendritic cell does not occur. In the presence of anti-CTLA, there is an emergence of memory T cells and a robust T cell response in the lymph node. So when these T cells go in the lymph node, uh, in the tumor cells, if PDL1 binding to PDL1 is not there, again, these pre-existing T cell response then helps in killing the tumor cell and or leads to cytokine production. So these are basically, you can say complementary and synergistic, one working at lymph node that is anti-CTLA and one working at tumor cell, which is a anti-PD1. Something that I already discussed, periphery, it is anti-CTLA and in tumor, it is anti-PD1. So here comes the topic of my discussion. Again, the take home message is just concentrate on the tailing of the curve. That is the most important thing in this uh, presentation. As discussed previously, a bigger study of 793 patient, DNO, non-small cell lung cancer, no prior systemic therapy, more importantly, no driver mutation. Stratified by squamous versus non-squamous. Please remember, of data here was two weekly, as against checkmate 9 LA, where it was three weekly in a dose of uh, 360. Here it was three milligram per kg with ROI, which was one mg per kg, six uh, weekly, till tumor progression or unacceptable toxicity or up to two years. The primary endpoint was overall survival. The most important thing is now, this is the longest update we have for any IO study in combination with IO, and it was 54.8 months. Majority were current and former smokers, 80%, non squamous 70%, and half of them were more than 50% PDL1, and half was less than 50%. Now concentrate on your data. What we know is the overall survival with this combination is 17.1 versus 14.9 with a okay of hazard ratio of 0.76. Each one of us will say that keynote 189 it was 0.454 and it was 22 months. 
but now the most important thing is to see the three year survival or a four year survival at three years 33% of the patient are surviving but what takes our cake is at four year only 4% of the patient has died this is what we call as classical tailing only 4% dying from three to four years 29% at four years has never been achieved by any of the trial which was mentioned with chemo and io if you look into your keynote 189 even at 3 years the survival was 31% you can't so probably when when in less than 1% it was only 23% so probably some things is when you look for a long term survival probably io io is now the way the data is coming is very impressive data what about squamous and non squamous as discussed with venu overall squamous cells behave poorly irrespective of anything even both the arms. But when you again see the three and a four year, 37 versus 30 and 32, 24 versus 20. In fact, these are again most impressive number and only four to five percent patient progressing at three to four years. And that is what the main advantage of giving a IOIO. A long term responses or long term survivals are best when you give a IOIO. The most important thing again, what about duration of response or a long term data? Again, the second part of what we call as tailing. Suppose if you are responding at six months, 70% of the patient at the end of another three years, that is 42 months, still continue to be alive. So if you are responding at six months and you are alive, there is a 70% chance that you will be alive at the end of three and a half years. Again, again, you remember your checkmate 214, and I think this is similarly replicating 70% surviving at three and a half years who are surviving or responding at six months. What about response rate? We don't expect a good response rate when there is no chemo. So 36.4 PFS of 5.1, but a four-year PFS of 14%, which is equally impressive. The other important point, what is the duration of response? So this duration of response, again, of two years, remember your 15 months or more of keynote 189. So if you respond, the median duration of response will, will be at least two years. Again, if you see, 38% at three years and 34% at four years, which was 7%. So five times more duration of response when you give a IO, IO against chemotherapy. Again, this quantum, this difference is probably the maximum in any of the clinical trial in non-small cell lung cancer. Now, when we talk about side effects, this is something we worry. I would like you to concentrate on grade three, four only here because 6% fatigue. I'll go back. I beg your pardon. Uh, 6% fatigue, 4.7% skin rash, 2.3% decreased appetite, 1.9% musculoskeletal, 3.6% diarrhea, 4.3% dyspnea, highest was hepatitis 9%, 7% was pneumonia. So whenever we talk about side effects, the grade 3 or 4 significant side effect was less than 10% in all, all, all the side effects mentioned, what I had discussed. Now, when you talk about, that is again, the patient who did not or who stopped the drug due to treatment related adverse event TARE. This was probably again the most impressive. Even at the three year discontinuation, 53% was still responding. The response rate was 53%. The median overall survival was 30.6 months. Remember your overall survival, 17 months. So even if you stop the drug due to side effect, these patients probably respond the maximum among any trial because that immune system continues to work and control your cancer cell. A big thing, what I said, only 4% progression from three to four years, uh, impressive response rate, probably in terms of duration, twice or 24 months. So probably a drug we should use, think of considering now, probably because of the long-term data is very impressive. May, maybe more in those with, a, actually I was not allowed, those with a PDL one of less than one, the same responses are there in less than one and also in squamous cell also. So probably in those subsets which will be highlighted in the second part. So landmark four year overall survival 29 versus 18% among patients with PDL one of more than one, 70% of the responder at six months in this hour alive at three years later at 42 months. In a post hoc analysis, discontinuation of this combination did not have any negative effect. In fact, half of the responders who had a treatment related adverse event led to discontinuation, maintained their responses for more than three years. So probably a drug, probably with such a long-term data, you may again start thinking of it as you think in RCT. The second part of my presentation, 
what about adding two cycles of either a platen pem or a platen petlitexil based on your histopathology along with the same thing the only difference is here there was a fixed dose of 360 md every 3 weekly against 2 weekly in checkmate 227 with 6 weekly year one the main crux of adding two cycles of chemo was to provide a rapid disease control so the first part of the data where you see the uh, the immunotherapy that the the child that is less graft it is to control that again the same a big data a big study 719 same criteria non driver mutation dose is something 360 3 weekly with roi 1 md per kg 6 weekly treatment till progression unacceptable toxicity or 2 years additional are over uh, progression free response and the duration of response trial evaluated patient regardless of histology or pdl1 but less than 1% squamous Less than point hazard ratio probably the best in any of the immuno oncology study. Similarly, most of them are current former smokers, 80 to 90 percent, non-smokers, 70 percent, and PDL1 less than one and more than one were probably equally less, 40 percent less than one and 60 percent more than one. Now, when you look into the first year, when you look into overall 15.8, somebody might say that 17 months epinevo probably was better, but that had more of pdl1 more than 50 and here it is less than 1% was 40% so probably impressive data when you say 15.81 now when you look into two year data 38% percent, percent was surviving versus 26% percent. again this quantum of benefit or the difference with uh, chemotherapy remains the same now 37% of the patient treated at of data year over with two cycles were alive at two year in those with less than one this is something which i want to make you remember if you remember your data of keynote 40407 uh, two years probably it was 29% again i am i should not compare a cross trial comparison but the crux of my presentation is probably you need to see your less than one more than one squamous non squamous because with a long term data you are seeing that some combination works better in squamous and less than one it, it probably absolute gain of 8% and here it was 40% so a bigger number of patient 135 what about more than one and more than 50% pdl1 again as we all know that as the pdl1 is higher the overall uh, response is or a survival is better so 45% at 2 years in more than 50 and 41% at 2 uh, years in more than 1% so again a uh, good data now when you look into forest plot as all of us know that it worked in all the tests that except two and that is what again i tend to tell you in a never smoker you should not use your io io single you have to add your chemotherapy any sort of chemotherapy or probably chemotherapy may be as good as a, a io combination when you are a never smoker so that is something that we need to understand and that has been already reiterated before and told by deepak correctly also and in this also so a never smoker i should never think of giving my io as a single agent you need to add your chemo other than that in all the subset the forest plot it was impressive and it was all towards left and it was statistically significant now comes the duration of response again when you talk about io io the main thing is a long term survival and a duration so three times better duration of response at 3 years so from 12% duration of response at 2 years to 34% so at 2 years this combination with two cycles of chemo nearly triple duration of response remember your 24 months in io io and here also it is close to uh, 15 months so when i talk about treatment related adverse event is it very high the answer is no 48% grade 3 4 probably the least among all these uh, trials of io chemo or io io 18% discontinuation of either of the two 14% discontinuation of both the drug i will be telling you how these 14% behave who had a treatment related adverse event only two that nine cycles of nevo could have been given in median and four cycles of ep in all of the patient so probably a tolerable thing now efficacy of patient who discontinued of the time year again if you see if you have responded and probably immune response will be more your survival was 27.5 months as against 15 months for the overall your response rate was 51% again impressive and more than half of the patient continued to have a response when they stopped the drug due to treatment related adverse effect so probably you may not be unlucky if you can manage your treatment related adverse event and you may stop the drug you still keep on doing well 
we had a data of 227 and again it has been substantiated that this again the responses are long term durable and probably the best now when you have a side effect a good slide that i observe you can see the timeline of adverse event when you give iuio earlier is hypersensitivity followed by skin related then followed by gi related and then you have all these long term most of the side effect with those discontinuation or management could be controlled over a period of 3 to 6 months so 1.6 to 11 3 months 8.4 to 20 highest 1.1 into 223 so 3 to 6 months most of the side effect could have been controlled with either a modification or either a stoppage and you have seen the impressive data if you have to stop it due to treatment related adverse event what about these toxicities grade 3 and 4 again try to concentrate on gray part 4.5 2.8 5.6 4.5 so probably there were side effects but none of the side effects was more than 5% so a combination that you can easily tolerate only 14% could have discontinued both you can you have to see and 18% either of the two that so probably a combination which is acceptable when you talk about hematological side effect again when you look into chemo arm grade 3 4 and when you look into the combination probably these grade 3 side effects were lesser and all were less than 10% anemia neutropenia alopecia thrombocytopenia mucosal inflammation febrile neutropenia neutro and pen so probably again a option which could be tried so at two years this was the final thing 38 versus 28 probably i will be more interested now if you see the three year data that has been presented it is 26% at three years overall that has been presented in this esco benefit is observed across all key subgroup including pdl1 expression and histology and that is where i want to like you to see at two years if you see your pdl1 was less than 1% your overall thing was around 25 to 26% even when you have squamous also your overall was around 25 to 26 so probably this was something of the one of the better things in squamous no new safety signal in a post hoc analysis again these things i always 56% of the responders who had a treatment related adverse event leading to discontinuation maintain the response so probably i have a patient not with this who had a tre pneumonitis and doing well for 3 years without any treatment checkmate 98 demonstrated that yes this combination is feasible with two cycles of chemo probably a new uh, can be considered as one of the treatment option and a new option in first line treatment with advanced non cell cell lung cancer i will add on in and if you have a squamous and less than pdl1 pdl1 of less than 1 this is a combination which has given you the best hazard ratio of 0.48 the last part the dosing was slightly different you can use any of the two 3 mg per kg as in checkmate 227 or a flat dose of 360 every 3 weekly along with verva which is a 6 weekly dose again i understand cost is always a concern but yes probably this people if the bms people are listening a cost thing we probably might use in more of our spamas in less than pdl1 of less than 1 last slide the landmark if you have not listened to my two four year os 29 from 33 to 29 the median duration of response two years probably the highest as again 6.7 in so and for checkmate nine la with two cycles of chemo two year landmark overall survival of 38% versus 26% with chemo as impressive probably a drug we should start thinking of it in future i thank you all for a patient here thank you sir thank you so much uh, any questions uh, sir hello yes yeah, yeah. Uh, very nice talk, sir. Bharat sir, uh, very nice talk to hear from you. So basically, two three inputs I just want to keep in view of uh, any postgraduate students here, sir. So checkmate two to seven. You know we are talking about four year survivals. You know where we have given only IVO plus IVO combination only for uh, two years. So that means essentially these drugs are acting like pro drugs, and the rest of the time it is the body's patient's immune system by which we are getting functional durable responses. that's what good thing what we always think about ivo long term benefit os benefit the four year os is in the range of 30% so that's one thing where you know uh, unprecedented uh, os data four years with ivo ivo combination and as usually when we are uh, talk about ivo ivo combination we always think about toxicities so i sometimes it is called as iio regimen 
no? But uh, if you think about the scheduling, if you look up, the 6 mg per kg, 1 mg per kg body weight every six weekly, I, which is very much less when we compare it with the dose which is used in RCC and melanoma. I think that's where one, uh, you know, toxicity issue is also uh, taken care. And uh, when we talk about uh, the other days, only two cycles plus IO, IO, you are done with two cycles. So the interesting part in uh, IO, IO plus two cycles is these two cycles, this regimen takes care of the early progressors. So that's what is very important, I think. And this benefit is across all PDL1 patients, less than 1% patients also. And this addition of CTLA4 adds on benefit in terms of brain meds also. That's what is also one I was just going through. So it's not that, you know, drug directly enters into the brain, but it's the, because of the activation of the T-lymphocytes, which can uh, enter activation of the T-lymphocytes, which can, uh, you know, efficiently enter into the brain that attacks the tumor. So all in all, Squamous cell histology, PDL1 less than 1%, CNS mats. This combination is an ideal candidate for checkmate 9LA, as you rightly pointed out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So much. And we move on to the next session. And the next session is sponsored by our academic partner, Novartis. And for this, I would like to invite Dr. G. Vamshi Krishna Reddy, who is Director of Medical Oncology and Hematology, Yashoda Hospital. And uh, he's going to talk on targeted treatments for RAF V600D and Metexon 14 mutated NSCs. Over to you. Good evening. Uh, am I, am I, is my screen visible? No, sir, not yet. I need to share this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, good evening. Uh, so uh, I think we'll be moving to the next uh, part where I'll be discussing about uh, the BRAF and Metexon 14 mutated yeah. NSCNC. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Venu uh, for uh, making uh, this talk very successful. And I was uh, going through the talks, it's very extensive on the lung cancer. And uh, though these are rare, we have seen these mutations and uh, we need to discuss about these mutations in the treatment of uh, lung cancer. So all of us know that uh, lung cancer is associated with a very high level of unmet need and uh, significant disease burden. So most of us know that majority of our lung cancer patients are three or four. And uh, the number in India, I think we all of us are seeing that the number of cases, even in non-smokers, are increasing. And the majority of them are in uh, smokers. We still see uh, in non-smokers as adenocarcinomas. And uh, it's a heterogeneous set of disease where we are seeing uh, various oncogenic drivers. Uh, the earlier part, we were testing hardly for, I think, uh, EGFR, ALK, and ROS because this with the drugs which were available. And uh, with the present available NGS panels, we are picking up more uh, uh, oncogenic driver mutations. And it's not limited to adenocarcinoma alone. I think uh, uh, the classic teaching was to go with uh, NGS testing only in the adenocarcinoma or non-smokers. But with the present evidence, I think it's prudent to go for testing in the uh, majority of the patients, even those with uh, unusual histologies like sarcomatoid or the papillary variants or the squamous histology, these are the variants where we will be testing. And uh, I'll be talking about these two mutations, which probably we don't have much of Indian data, but uh, the global uh, data, they show the BRAF at around 5.5% or somewhere between one to 5% is the data which the Indian studies have shown. And the Metexon 14, it's approximately in the same range as two to 4%. So uh, we are talking about a five to 8% of patients uh, who will be uh, having this rare mutation that is the BRAF V600 and the Metexon 14. And uh, does this prevalence change by race? Yes, all of us have seen that uh, EGFR mutation is quite common in the Asians. And if I'm talking about the specific mutations which I'll be dealing, 
the BRAF and uh, the uh, net mutation. So we can see that uh, the population uh, compared to the global population, the uh, Asian population, we are seeing very small number. It's almost going to less than 2% and the MET does not have any representation in the Asian population. So is it that common in our population? Uh, even I'm not sure, but MET amplification, I think it's going with the global data, but uh, BRAF, I'm not sure. Uh, and how do we test for this mutation? So. Uh, the classical testing of all of us were doing the uh, PGFR by PCR and alkan ross by uh, IHC. And if it were negative, we were sending for NGS. I think that has changed in the last couple of months or years because of widespread availability of NGS. And uh, probably we have more uh, testing facilities available now. So uh, we are testing with this the broad based NGS panels. And uh, even the uh, RNA based NGS panels is also available. And these are specifically helpful in testing for the MET exam code because it's not picked up by the hotspot panels usually. And because the, if we are picking up this MET exam 14 or the BRAF V600, we have uh, the therapeutic options presently available, which were <coughs> initially unavailable. So what's the advantage of this next generation sequencing for the diagnosis of these driver mutations? So all of us know that this broad molecular testing using NGS uh, makes the most efficient use of tissue compared to the single gene testing because that exhausts the tissue even though it is available. But NGS is a labor intensive method and uh, it's more like uh, expensive and it requires computational biology expertise. So all said, I think NGS is the way forward and that's going to pick up the specific mutations which I'll be talking about. And uh, for NGS testing, we have... Uh, uh, no artists which has tied up with LAL path labs and they are doing this NGS at 8,500. That's quite beneficial to patients and they're testing most of the genes which are druggable. So we have the BRAF and MET included in this. So other than that, we also have the ALK, EGFR, KRAS, NRAS, ROS, and NTRK. So I think this is helping us with testing of most of the druggable uh, mutations. And I think this is a great initiative from no artists that it's available for most of our patients at 8,500. Now, coming to the biomarker testing, what are we going to do and which patients? So I think uh, with the current guidelines where we are considering adjuvant EGFR TK inhibitors, so for 1B to 3A where we have a resectable non squamous histology, I think it's prudent to go for EGFR testing with or without NGS. Uh, and I think because we are using adjuvant uh, EGFRT case, this can be done in non squamous resective disease. But if you are considering for those for definitive chemo radiation, we still consider EGFR testing, but I think we have to avoid that of the LORA study. And for adenosquamous, uh, other varieties histology, if you are seeing the non squamous histology, uh, comprehensive NGS panel should be suggested in all patients. If you are going for the squamous, we need to select our patients. Uh, preferably young non-smokers, uh, but I think NGS panel should be considered in majority of our patients in the advanced setting. So coming to the specific mutations, uh, the BRAF V600E mutation and NSCLC, I think this is the VRAF urine sarcoma viral oncology homolog B or BRAF, which is encoded by the BRAF gene. So this is a mutation which was probably taught to us in melanoma, but now has widespread role in other malignancies also. So all of us know the RAS, RAF, make air pathway. So the BRAF mutation usually uh, leads to constitutive activation of this MAP kinase pathway. So this is a 7 3 orient kinase, which belongs to the RAS, RAF, make air pathway. And normal cells, this is activated and it's lead to uh, proliferation and survival. But when there is a mutation in the BRAF, specifically the V600, this leads to its constitutive activation and downstream signaling of the MEC uh, and it causes tumor agencies. Whether it's seen only in lung, no, it was initially seen in melanoma. Even the uh, hairy cell leukemia also has this BRAF mutation. We also see it in papillary thyroid cancer, colorectal cancer, and specifically the topic I'm discussing the lung cancer. BRAF V600 is the most common mutation and it's usually the point mutation in exon 15 in the BRAF gene where adenine is substituted by thiamine, which constitutively activates this BRAF and activation of the downstream mechanism causing tumorogenesis. So this is the whole tumorogenesis of the 
uh, BRAF V600 imitation. Is it only the BRAF V600? We also have the non V600 imitations, uh, which are usually uh, seen, but they also have been studied with this uh, trial. So whether we are dealing with a V600 or non V600, we need to consider uh, because the prognosis and the drug response changes if we are using in a non V600. The BRAF mutation uh, in NSCLC, you know, we know that it's approximately one to 5%, as I already said, Indian data not much, but uh, it's a commonest mutation when uh, most prevalent in adenocarcinomas. And we usually see it in female gender and usually in the elder age. Specific histology where probably we should be considering is a micropapillary variant where it's known to be very aggressive. I think the prevalence varies across the population. So highest being somewhere uh, around 5% in the Europeans, uh, Chinese have around 1 to 2%. And we can see that uh, it's between V600E to non-V600E, that's very important. So I think we can see the smoking status. Uh, moderate trials, so if you have given for smoking and non for non-smokers, uh, but also I think V600E is a common mutation which we will be discussing. And V600 is a targeted mutation in uh, NSCLC, mainly that we do have druggable uh, mutation and we have two drugs, wonderful drugs, which are available for this mutation. Uh, the prognostic value of BRAF is still being debated because few studies have shown that this improves our outcome, few have shown that it is not good, but uh, I think we have small trials where uh, we have seen around 40 to 70% of the patients, we can see that in the second hand also, the survival always was around uh, with the targeted therapy, it was touching five to uh, four and a half to five years. So what's the treatment which is suggested? So the FDA approved treatment for BRAF, V600, NSCLC is a combination of dabrafenib and trametinib. It's a combination drugs. Why are we using two drugs? So uh, we have uh, only V600E mutation inhibitors, that is dabrafenib, uh, which is an inhibitor of the BRAF V600E. But we also need an uh, inhibitor of the downstream pathway, which is egg, because there is, uh, if you are using both in combination, uh, that MEK inhibition is also suggested by trametinib. So trametinib causes a reversible inhibitor and uh, it causes their uh, preventing the activation and the kinase activity. And by ending of the BRAF and MEK inhibitors to this target generates a blockade in the MAP kinase pathway at two different levels, inhibiting downstream signaling and causes cell cycle arrest. So the BRAF V600 mutation uh, with the dabrafenib monotherapy leads to paradoxical, paradoxical activation of downstream uh, effectors, mainly the MEK and DEP. So for this reason, it's always given with the combination. So dabrafenib and trametinib in V600 mutation. So the study design, this was a phase two uh, trial where they had uh, three cohorts. So we can see that uh, we'll be discussing mainly about the cohort B and C because this included both dabrafenib and trametinib. The cohort A had only dabrafenib monotherapy. So the difference between the cohort B and C, we can see is that cohort C had is a treatment naive. The cohort B had earlier treatment. So uh, the dosing was, uh, dabrafenib was given an FBD dosing and trametinib was given as an OD dosing. Uh, the patient uh, age, I think the median age was 64 in this patient and uh, the, the most of the sites of uh, metastatic disease was in the lymph nodes in almost 50% of the patients. And the therapies used after dabrafenib was almost chemotherapy or immunotherapy, what we usually use for most of these patients. The results of this uh, study was that the combination of dabrafenib and trametinib resulted in higher overall response rate and a longer median PFS when compared with dabrafenib monotherapy alone. The overall response rates, I think we can see that uh, with monotherapy, it was 33. And uh, with if you are going with the combination in the treatment, it was almost touching 64 months. And the uh, PFS was around 10 months with the overall survival crossing one and a half year. So this is quite good for BRF V600, so almost one and a half uh, year survival, uh, OS survival for those on this dabrafenib and trametinib combination. And the safety profile, the most common uh, A's which we were seeing was the hypertension which was seen in 10% of the patient, uh, hyponatremia, uh, oh. dyspnea, pyrexia, and also we need to monitor the uh, hemoglobin level and also the liver labs. 
So uh, with this uh, trial, I think uh, FDA has approved uh, dabrafenib and trametinib as the first line treatment for those with this BRAF V600 mutation. Even I think approved by both the NCC and and ISMO guidelines, both of them have quoted this. And if we are not using this in first line, I think if we are getting detected with a BRAF uh, V600 in the later lines, I think probably if we, even if they have received chemotherapy earlier, we can consider this in the later lines. And uh, I think we can see that the immunotherapy also does help at, but if we see the overall response rate is much by higher with the combination compared to other drugs with monotherapy, either dabrafenib, or immunotherapy. So uh, this is about uh, the BRAF V600E. So this is the only approved drugs being uh, dabrafenib and trametinib. So from there, we move on to the next part of the talk where I'll be discussing about the metexone 14 mutated NSLC. So again, we have uh, three or four drugs which are tested in metoxone 40 mutation, but capmatinib uh, with the gem trial uh, stays away. So uh, all of us know that uh, met oncogenic activation can also occur via, via multiple mechanisms. And we have met amplification fusions and the uh, exon 14 skipping mutations. So all this uh, are uh, related to the hepatocyte growth factor and there is uh, autophosphorylation and uh, with this, Met exon 40 mutations, there is continuous part of phosphorylation and there will be uh, impaired degradation causing tumorogenesis. And it's a common mutation uh, which is observed in around 3 to 4 percent of the patients. And I think we have uh, various studies which have the highest frequency in those with the sarcomatoid histology. So we have studies from across, I think, Japan, US, Hong Kong, and I think we can see that the percentage across most of them. The highest being in a sarcomatoid histology where we are seeing that 22% of the patients have this metaxone 14. So other histologies, we can see it's coming around the same 4 to 5%. So uh, what are the clinical characteristics of this exon 14 NSLC? So it's uh, approximately 3% of the patients in elderly patients, that is 72.5 years was the median age, and more frequently observed in adenocarcinoma, specifically in those with sarcomatoid features. There is no clear association with the smoking, and it's an aggressive disease if they have this metexone 14. Uh, prognostication, yeah, compared to the BRAF, where there is a debatable thing, metexone is associated uh, with worse survival. So we can see that those who have the metexone 14 mutation, their survival is much inferior compared to those who do not have this mutation. But do we make a difference with the targeted therapy? Yes. If the patient with this metexone 14 receives a targeted therapy, we can see that the survival has improved from 8.1 to 24.6 months with any of this met PKS when used. So met exone 14 NSCS is associated with poor response to chemo, immunotherapy, and other therapies. The only things which help in metexone 14 mutation is metexone inhibiting TKS. So we can see that earlier, we, I think probably most of us were four or five years back, we were using Prizotnik, which even at the time was showing overall response rate of 32%, which was much higher compared than the immunotherapy and chemotherapy. So we have various classes of uh, MET inhibitors, type 1, 2, and 3. Uh, My apologies, sir, you left two minutes to uh, We have Capmatinib, which is the drug which I'll be discussing. And this is uh, approved by FDA for use in the meta exon 14 mutation. So this is an overall ATP competitive inhibitor. And uh, this was based on the JMATA trial. They have multiple cords. So we will be discussing specifically about the four cords where there is metexon 14 mutation and uh, well-balanced across the subtypes. And I think we have four and uh, seven and five B and seven where we can see that uh, it was treatment naive and those were treated earlier. So for those the treatment naive histology where we are, there is a metexon 14, we can see the overall response rate was around 67% and the median PFS was 12 months, OS was 20 months. This is quite good for treatment naive. Although the numbers are small, I think the overall response rate and OS was much better. And for those the pre-treated, I think we can see overall response rate of 40 and uh, OS being 30 months. And also this uh, capmatinib works well in those with brain metastasis. I think we can see where it has done excellently well for a lady uh, with brain metastasis. The class effect being uh, peripheral edema, GA symptoms, and rice creatinine, uh, that's with the MET inhibitors. And the uh, capmatinib demonstrated clinically meaningful efficacy based on this. It was approved by the FDA for use in MET exon 14 mutation. And how do we manage edema? Most of the times it's just supportive care, elevations, or stockings, diuretic, and most of the times physical therapy. 
We do have other drugs, amivantinib, elzovantinib, and savalantinib, which are being studied. And I think amivantinib, there was a phase one trial which was just reported in the ASCO 2022. It's based on the CRISAL trial. So again, uh, the clinical benefit, you can see that the PFS was 6.7 months. Not that great. So I think here still capmatinib beats this drug. So the conclusion of this was this, it needs further study, uh, but the drug which needs to be looked for. So to conclude, I think the current treatment paradigm for the biomarker positive, the fear of V600E, uh, dabrafenib and trametinib, dabrafenib at 150 MGBV and trametinib 2 MGOD is the preferred uh, FDA approved regimen. For uh, metexon 14, we have capmatinib, which is the uh, drug of choice for the metexon 14 skipping mutation. So that's about these two drugs. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for excellent presentation. And Venugopal, sir, your questions. Yeah. Uh, very nice talk, sir. Actually, speaking, very tough topic in fact, because little less heard of this topic, I guess. So the key takeaway, I think we should not miss these uh, rarer uh, mutations like BRF section ready mutation in NSCLC and met uh, exon 14 skip mutations because we have got effective uh, you know targeted treatments for these mutations as well as so we should look these mutations in terms of uh, easier for all cross one kind of mutations in view of therapeutic approach and uh, in metaxon 14 skip mutations the FDA has approved for two drugs one is uh, capmatinib other, other one is tepotinib the, the other drug which is being tried in this setting is amivantamab as you rightly noted this is a bispecific antibody Again, it's EZFR as well as MET. This has already got breakthrough approval in the EZFR exon 20 insertion mutations, and it to go for uh, uh, MET exon 14 skip mutations. And when we talk about the BRAF V600A, we heard a lot uh, about these mutations in melanoma. And uh, in uh, long NSCLC, most of them are non V600E, only about 50% are V600E mutations because it has got therapeutic uh, you know, utility, as you rightly pointed out. This uh, our drug uh, dabrafenib plus trametinib combination works only for V600E or V600K, but not for non-V600 mutations. So that's one thing we, what we have to uh, keep in uh, watch when we are uh, interpreting our results and uh, going ahead for the treatment of these uh, patients. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you so much. So next we move on to the next session. Just one. So by our academic partner, AstraZeneca. And for this, I would like to invite Dr. Rajesh Bolan, who is consulting medical oncologist and clinical oncologist, Keshoda Hospital, Hyderabad. And he's going to speak about turning the tides for stage three NSCLC towards the curative intent. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, organizers, for giving me this opportunity. Today, I'll be speaking on stage three NSCLC with, treated with curative intent. Next slide. So as we know from the Globocan 2020 data, the total lung cancer incidence is about approximate 88,000, out of which 80,000 uh, patients had a lung cancer deaths. Almost incidence to death ratio, if you see, it's almost uh, close to a tune of around 10%. It's the second most common ca cause of cancer deaths in the male. Next slide. So if you see burden of the lung cancer in India, majority of the patients do present in an advanced state. And if you see specifically locally advanced state, that is stage uh, two and three, it is al almost one third, 35% of patients do present in a locally advanced state. Next slide. If you see the approaches of a metastatic uh, management of a locally advanced stage three unresectable NSCLC, it is typically uh, done by a, a MDT, which includes a pathologist, radiation oncologist, medical oncologist, pulmonologist, and a thoracic surgeon. It is one of the cases where in which typical MDT management is required because majority of the times we do see unforeseen end tools and uh, scan negative with mediastinal positivity. So you see multiple times the surprises. Hence, you need to involve all your team on board prior to uh, sequencing of the therapies. So if you see the diagnostic and pretreatment evaluation, it includes PFT, bronchoscopy. For a metastatic workup, we require FDG PET scan and an MRI brain with a contrast. And the most important thing, pathological mediastinal node in, uh, evaluation, either to confirm or defute the diagnosis of uh, lymphadenopathy or lymph node involvement in a known case. The treatment of a stage 3 NSCLC is definitive CRT and uh, we have two approaches, concurrent and sequential. Concurrent scores over the sequential. Next slide. So if you see the imaging or as, uh, if uh, whenever you see a uh, patient 
extent of uh, local original NSCLC. Uh, the imaging can be of three types. One is uh, a, a small peripheral tumor with no enlarged lymph nodes. Uh, second subset with no enlarged lymph nodes, but a central tumor or a hilar lymph nodes. Enlarged but discrete lymph nodes. And the third category is extensive uh, end to infiltration of the mediastinum. So when you see the first category, that is a small peripheral tumor with no enlarged lymph nodes, you need to do the invasive lymph nodal uh, uh, investigation and uh, see if it is uh, whether uh, in this category of patients, you del if the patient have a negative uh, lymph nodes on the pet, you, you need not do the mediastinoscopy. In the second category, when you uh, it requires a mediastinoscopy wherein which you can have either N0 to N1 or an N2 or an N3. And on the other side, if you have got an uh, N2 disease, extensive mediastinal infiltration, majority of the times we consider it as an unresectable N2 and we usually go for a non-surgical modality of the treatment. So you can have a three categories of N2 that is unresectable N2 and uh, on scan and imaging seems to be uh, uh, resectable and post-surgery you can have an unforeseen N2 or predetermined potentially resectable N2. For a surgery, uh, for a patient who had underwent a surgery upfront and who has got post-surgery unforeseen N2, the therapeutic approach would be adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, chemoradiotherapy, and a potentially resectable N2, you can have an, a dedicated multi multidisciplinary team, uh, which includes NSCT followed by CTRT, NSCT followed by surgery. You can have uh, sequential modalities like surgical mod multimodality treatment. And for an undesectable N2, the treatment would be CTRT. Next slide. So traditionally, intent of treatment in stage three setting is curative with CTRT, and uh, intent of approach is the curative intent approach. Majority of the times uh, we give uh, concurrent uh, chemotherapy, and the most common uh, chemotherapy regimen we use is paclitaxel. Next slide. If you see the various regimens uh, in the concurrent regimens, especially the maximum benefit is seen with the Pemetrexa plus Cisplatin. Uh, the PFS is around 11.4 months and the median OS is around 26 months. Uh, whereas uh, the, because of the toxicity profile, majority of the times we end up giving in uh, Paclicarbo. But the patient is fit and uh, uh, can take the concurrent uh, Cis plus uh, Pemetrexa, that would be the best regimen to give ahead. Next slide. So, uh, Post this therapy, consolidation trials have been tried to improve the uh, to improve the outcomes, but none of the consolidation uh, strategies uh, have uh, made any significant benefit. Next slide. Intent of treatment in stage three setting is a curative with uh, concurrent chemo radiation, but the main unmet need is the five year OS, which is as dismissal as fifteen to twenty five percent. Hence, this has uh, uh, become a huge unmet need, and we. Uh, we are in dire need uh, prior to the in introduction of uh, Durva uh, for improvement of uh, stage three uh, survivals. Next slide. Immuno oncology uh, helps to improve the survival. Chemo radiation, the mecha, the logic of combining Durva post chemo radiation is once when you give a chemo radiation. Uh, induction of tumor antigen release and adaptive immuno response and pdl one upregulation happens. Once this PD1 overexpression leads to immune cell invasion and T cell inhibition. When you uh, sequence after this chemo radiation with durvalumab, this durvalumab blocks the pdl one uh, and restores the T cell function, and the reversal of immune suppression leads to systemic anti-tumor response. Next slide. This forms the basis of uh, sequencing chemo radiation with a durvalumab. So now let us. Um, so in the next five to 10 minutes, we'll uh, dive, deep dive into a specific study, which is a phase three randomized double blinded placebo control multicentral international study, international study, wherein we stage three locally advanced undesectable NSCLC patient who have not progressed following a definitive CTRT, uh, 18 year old elder with good performance status, estimated life expectancy of more than three months, whose archived tissue was collected. And post therapy, one to 40 days post CCRT have been randomized into two groups, two is to one randomization. Uh, 476 uh, odd population have been randomized to durvalumab 10 mg per kg IV every two weekly up to 12 months and the second group received placebo uh, for 12 months. The primary endpoint being the PFS, key secondary endpoint being overall response rate, duration of response, safety and tolerability and patient reported outcomes. Next slide. So if you see the patient baseline characteristics, age, sex, race, disease stage, uh, ECOG performance status were well uh, uh, well balanced between the dualumab and the placebo arm. Uh, and the point to be noted here is uh, in this uh, study, we have got EGFR positive population around 6% each in uh, both dualumab and placebo. Next slide. 
and uh, if you see the uh, pdl and expression pdl when percentage is less than 25 in around 40% more than 25 to 24% and unknown is 36% in the duralumab arm we have got both equally both squamous and non squamous histology and uh, point to be noted here is 27% of this patient had prior uh, induction chemotherapy still they do got benefited next slide if you see the updated 5 year overall survival uh, almost uh, it's 42.9% uh, 5 year overall survival compared to the uh, placebo which is around 33.4 months uh, if you see the hazard ratio it's 0.72 numerically 28% reduction in the chance of death and if you see the median os it is to a tune of around almost 4 years 47.5 months which is nearly unheard of in uh, stage 3 nsclc next slide it's the first and only approved uh, therapy uh, to prolong the os and if you see the updated uh, pfs uh, it is 16.9 months uh, versus 5.6 months uh, versus in the placebo and the hazard ratio being 0.55 there is a 45 percent reduction in the risk of progression and if you see the five year pfs it's almost 33 percent at the end of five years one third of each patient have been still maintaining on therapy next slide if you see the two year three year four year data have previously reaffirmed the consistent and robust benefit of the Pacific regimen, and the OS is uh, OS hazard ratio is being maintained uh, to a tune of around 0.72 even at the end of five years. This demonstrates the continued and sustained benefit which is seen with the Durvalumab. Next slide. If you see, uh, if you see the all pre-specified subgroups, irrespective of the sex, age of randomization, smoking status, disease status, uh, tumor histological uh, types, and prior treatment response. Uh, PDL1 expression in majority of the groups, uh, the treatment favored Durvalumab arm, except in the uh, PG in the EGFR positive subgroup, wherein which the it crossed the line of unity. Next slide. And if you see the even PFS benefit in all the pre-specified subgroups, uh, the PFS benefit uh, favored the uh, Durvalumab arm. Next slide. And the most important thing is, even if the disease has progressed, the patterns, if you see the patterns of disease progression, uh, majority of the patients who have been progressed on Durvalumab are intrathoracic, nearly to a tune of around 80%. And you have seen around the decreased rate of progression up to 45% when compared to 64% of uh, patients had progression on the placebo. Next slide. And if you see the patterns of disease progression, as I said previously, majority of the patients on Durvalumab had an intrathoracic progression when compared to the patient on placebo arm, they had an extrathoracic uh, progression. Next slide. My apologies, sir, you left for two minutes. Yeah. So the first subsequent therapy after discontinuation, if you see in Durvalumab, 41% of the patient and 54% of the patient on the placebo arm has uh, received six subsequent therapy, which means post uh, Durvalumab, even the patient's performance status is very good to continue the further therapies. Next slide. Safety summary. One of the most commonly discussed side effect is uh, pneumonitis. Uh, uh, that could be post CRT radiation pneumonitis, or already exacerbation of existing radiation pneumonitis, or the drug as such can cause. But if you see the discontinuation discontinuation rate with durmalumab uh, is almost a tune of around fifteen point four percent. Next slide. Uh, usage of durmalumab in the real world. Next slide. To some next slide. A majority of the patients were less than 75 age and 14% of the patient received sequential and rest of all 86% patient received concurrent therapy. Next slide. The median duration of starting of Durvalumab after CRT is around 40 to 56 days. Priorly in the Pacific, it has to be in the less than 42 days. But even in the uh, real world data, if you see the median PFS is to turn off around 21.7 months in, in sync with the uh, Pacific trial. Next slide. Next slide. No new adverse events were seen and all the adverse events were comparable to the Pacific trial. Next slide. The, it is a, Durvalumab is the first and only approved immunotherapy to improve the OS and PFS in stage 3 patient. An improvement of 11.2 months in the median PFS and 32% reduction in the overall risk of death. Hazard ratio being 0.68. And it's the only immunotherapy agent uh, to have an improvement in the OS and stage 3 uh, 
And the median OS was to a tune of around 47.5 months for Duralumab versus 29.1 months for a placebo. Next slide. Uh, discontinuation rate was to a tune of around 15.4 uh, uh, percent in the Duralumab, out of which 6.3 percent of the discontinuation was to pneumonitis. And the major common adverse events would be uh, cough, upper respiratory tract infection, and the rash. Next slide. The key takeaways from my presentation are Durvaluma demonstrated a statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvement in both OS and PFS. Median OS was 47.5 months, whereas median PFS is 17.2 months. Improvement in PFS and OS was seen across all the pre-specified subgroups. Five-year OS is 42.9 months, and the one-third of the patients both uh, were alive and free of disease, demonstrating the sustainable OS benefit and PFS with the specific regimen. Patients receiving the Durvalumab had lower incidence of new lesions, including the brain metastasis, compared to the patient receiving the placebo. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, yeah, uh, over to Venerable, sir, for any questions. Yeah, uh, very nice talk, uh, nice talk by Dr. Rajesh. So basically, we are talking about, uh, you know, unresectable stage three disease. So in which Pacific has given us good data, we can say, where we have got five-year overall survival difference, absolute difference, 10%, uh, that is essentially 43% uh, versus 33%, and five-year PFS rates also absolute difference being around close to 13%. So this, uh, so essentially one-third of the patients remain alive and without disease progression in unresectable stage three with Durva maintenance setting a new benchmark uh, standard of care. So I think uh, if the finances are not an issue, the ideal candidates on resectable stage three should go on to receive it. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead for the next topic, uh, moderator-based, uh, case-based panel discussion. I'll continue. Yes, sir. Sure. Yeah. So request if you can save five minutes for us. We are delayed by 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, definitely, sure. So by the time you... Just your slides. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome the esteemed panelists. Hello. Yeah. So we have uh, Dr. Srinath Badwaj, uh, Associate Consultant Medical Oncologist from Apollo, Dr. Monica Bopanna from Kim Hospital, Hyderabad, Dr. Rachna from Nizam Institute of Medical Sciences, Dr. Shay. Reddy from Omega Hospital, Dr. Ram Pilat from uh, uh, Mara Reddy Cancer Hospital Research Institute, Hyderabad, and Dr. Sharachan Kudeti, uh, uh, Consul Medical and Hemat Oncologist uh, from Hyderabad. So, all are present. Over to you, Dr. Venugopal. Yeah. So, a very good evening to all. Uh, now, uh, we'll have a case based panel discussion optimal management of extensive uh, stage small cell lung cancer in the first line setting. So I think uh, we have all panelists uh, with me. So basically, yeah. So this is the patient uh, we are going to have a look at. So 62 year old uh, male, current smoker with history of 30 packs per year, presented with increasing shortness of breath, hemoptysis, weight loss, and early fatality. On physical examination, he is found to have uh, heptomegaly, and large box have showed. Uh, you know, raised LT and AST three times more than upper normal. Yeah. And he underwent CT scan, post and abdomen. There's some disturbance, I guess. So he underwent CT scan, chest and abdomen, uh, shows left lower lobe nodule, mediastinal adenopathy, and massive hepatomegaly. Biopsy from the lung nodule shows uh, squamous, uh, small cell lung cancer histology. So, Coming to the first question, what's your diagnostic workup for a patient with suspected small cell lung cancer? Uh, I would like to begin with uh, Dr. Monica. Um, good evening, sir. For the yeah, staging workup, um, I would go for a PET scan. And uh, if it is uh, um, limited stage, then I would like to do an MRI brain also, even if the patient is asymptomatic. But if it's extensive stage, unless the patient is symptomatic, I wouldn't do an MRI. Only if the patient has any CNS-related symptoms, I would do it. And uh, apart from that, the routine uh, uh, biochemistry and uh, a complete blood picture would, and also for the fitness for chemotherapy, 2D echo, if I'm planning for cisplatin-based, I would like to do that. 
um, and a biopsy, yes, of course, uh, uh, CT guided or bronchoscopic biopsy, depending on the uh, accessibility to the most easily accessible lesion. Yeah, well, I think you have covered everything. So with that, we'll go to Dr. Uh, Rachna. So would you like to go for uh, molecular profiling in a suspected small cell lung cancer, uh, Dr. Uh, Rachna? No, sir. In a suspected small cell lung cancer, I wouldn't go for a molecular profiling. So are um, there any patients in which the, uh, you would like to go ahead, any subset of patients, even uh, though suspected small cell lung cancer, anything like that okay. you feel? I mean, most of the times we may not encounter, but you know, no, the molecular profiling only yes, for sir. never smokers with extensive stage, yes. uh, we would like to do even in small but cell lung cancer. But that is not commonly seen, sir. Most of the small yeah. cell lung cancer but patients know, are smokers, so yes. we generally yes. don't see a so non-smoker female. Not, yeah. So most of the times it may not be even required. So this uh, CT guided biopsy of the liver mass was done, which has confirmed metastatic involvement by small cell uh, carcinoma and brain MRI was also done, uh, which uh, has uh, no abnormal findings. So, Dr. Srinath, what's your take on brain MRI? So, would you like to brain MRI for every time or are you happy with PET CT? So, how do you go about that? Uh, I do uh, brain MRI every time, sir. The, that is just for a documentation purpose uh, so that uh, uh, we are clear that uh, <clears throat> the, there is a uh, complete response there also. Or else uh, uh, we would uh, uh, plan radiation at the later stage. So you'd that be comfortable in uh, doing brain MRI, even though you do PET CT? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'm doing it. Good. Good. So, yeah. So this uh, diagnosis of this particular patient was extensive stage small cell lung cancer with liver meds. He doesn't have any other uh, metastatic site of involvement uh, apart from the liver alone. So Dr. Sharat, so which staging system do you use in extensive stage small cell lung cancer as a part of uh, you know your day to day clinical practice? PNM or VALSG veterans group? Uh... Sir, as a routine practice, we follow DNM staging only, sir. Okay. So even uh, if the patient has a big tumor, you know you don't uh, consider it in a way of a limited stage disease or in the extensive stage disease for clinical decision uh, purposes. So, so for clinical decisions, uh, just between uh, to differentiate between limited and extensive stage, yes. Uh, but uh, if uh, once we get to know that uh, they are extensive, then uh, we uh, uh, manage them accordingly with the TNM stage. Okay. So Dr. Ram Prahalad, so most of our patients, small cell lung cancer, tend to present uh, with SVC syndrome. So how do you manage uh, SVC syndrome at the initial presentation when they come to us? Uh, uh, for the in the even uh, even before the treatment is initiated i generally give the support to care initially uh, to decrease the edema and all those things and uh, i generally manage with uh, radiation actually so dr rachna what's what's your take uh, in terms of adjunctive treatments like in terms of steroids uh, anticoagulants and uh, intravenous stenting or radiation before systemic therapy uh, in terms of managing SVC syndrome for uh, extensive stage small cell lung cancer patients? So initially, I would like to initially get a biopsy, sir. But after doing the basic measures like the propped up position, oxygenation, and the LASIK, before even, uh, when, if you are starting steroids in the night, at least in the morning, I would like to get a biopsy from the lesion, whichever site is accessible. And if it is... Uh, I mean, we'll be behind the pathologist to give at least a morphological diagnosis. If it is not lymphoma, we can give steroids for one or two days to reduce the edema. And uh, if we get a diagnosis of small cell lung cancer, we would consider giving the uh, chemotherapy. But uh, the anticoagulation and uh, stenting is not routinely done. Sir. So, yeah. So now going to the proper management of this particular patient. So the chemotherapy regimens in first line extensive stage small cell lung cancer. So what is your choice of platinum uh, in EP regimen cisplatin versus carboplatin and why, uh, Dr. Monica? So if the patient is uh, fit for cisplatin, I would go for cisplatin. If there's any contraindication, uh, then uh, uh, carboplatin, uh, the equivalence has been uh, proven in small cell lung cancer. So in cisplatin unfit patients, I would go for carboplatin. 
and uh, yes sir yeah dr shaini reddy what's your choice of platinum in ap regimen sir cisplatin? i am commonly using cisplatin etoposide combination sir uh, because in view uh, in view of hematological toxicity with carboplatin being most common i am not seeing so much of emesis with the cisplatin etoposide regimen so i am comfortable in giving cis etop okay so but what if the patient has svc syndrome the question of you know the always the challenges of hydration uh, all that if it comes you may would like yeah, to particular use. scenarios then modification sir but as a routine cisplatin etoposide okay so number of cycles used commonly in your practice tiny i am using uh, six cycles sir for this one for small cell okay so what are your views on any other chemotherapy Ah, uh, like irinotecan in first line uh, setting. First line, I never used irinotecan, sir. Okay, so basically, what would be your first line treatment for this patient with extensive stage small cell lung cancer with liver metastasis, Dr. Srinath? So how would you plan this? So this was just an introductory kind of questionnaire. So going about this particular uh, patient, so what would be your plan for this patient? Ah, uh, keeping the Finances support. Uh, I would definitely go with uh, uh, platinum, etoposide, and uh, immunotherapy, sir. Uh, because we're keeping the finances aside. Though the benefit is not really great, uh, it may be a matter of couple of months. But uh, uh, yes, uh, there is a statistically significant benefit. So uh, as long as it's not toxic to the pocket, uh, I don't mind adding the immunotherapy uh, to the uh, doublet. Agreed. Most patients relapse after initial treatment, as we know, in extensive stage disease, fifty to sixty percent of the patients, uh, uh, you know, and seventy to ninety percent of the patients in limited stage disease, approximately eighty percent of the patients with limited stage disease, and all patients with extensive stage disease relapse, even though they have uh, even, uh, I mean, they have excellent response rates in the initial phases. So after these advances. Even in 2022, would you still go ahead with only chemotherapy in first line, uh, Doctor Rachna, without IVO? Sir, Are there any uh, if, candidates? Do you feel that you know uh, we can't offer this benefit because just uh, it's an incremental benefit of two months in, a, in an aggressive malignancy like small cell lung cancer? So, any particular thoughts on this? Only chemo without sir, IVO? Uh, no unless if there benefit. is a contraindication to IVO. Like an autoimmune disease, I would consider giving IO plus chemotherapy only if there is no financial constraint. We we are not using in our institute because of the financial constraints. But yes, if given an option in a tumor like small cell lung cancer, where we don't have much approved options other than chemotherapy, giving an agent which improves the um, survival by at least two or three months, as has been shown in the trial, uh, the absolute benefit of two to three months. Even if we consider that, that's also a good benefit in terms of an extensive stage small cell lung cancer. So unless there is an absolute contraindication for immunotherapy, uh, rest of the people I would be happy to give IO plus chemotherapy. Exactly. So look at these, uh, you know, the IO drug combinations, Durva plus uh, Durva Atrejo. So we look at these median uh, survivals: twelve point nine months, twelve point three months, twelve months, twelve months. When we compare with the conventional chemotherapies, nine months. So in a in an aggressive malignancy like small cell lung cancer. I agree that it's a very short incremental benefit of overall survivals, but that's how I think we should build on uh, with whatever is available. So unless there are contraindications, like uh, said before, uh, autoimmune diseases, immunosuppression, I think we should uh, uh, go for taking this benefit because we hardly come across patients who cross, you know, one uh, year. Uh, one and a half year before the small cell lung cancer patient, we never, we rarely see. But now we are talking about uh, three year survivals that we'll see a little later with the updated survivals. So, what's the rationale to add immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, to chemotherapy in small cell lung cancer, Dr. Monica? So, what's uh, what are your thoughts? See, because you see, small cell lung cancer, as you know, is associated with the smokers, right? And smokers are expected to have higher burden, tumor tumor mutation burden. higher neuro antigens but still you know we don't get that kind of extensive good responses in uh, small cell lung cancer with ivo what's what are your thoughts um the theoretical rationale is um, as discussed earlier sir that uh, uh, when uh, because they are very very chemo sensitive tumors and uh, once they're exposed to chemotherapy a lot of uh, cell lysis happens and 
a lot of antigens get released and that attracts more T lymphocytes. So a lot of T lymphocytes infiltrate the tumor. And that's how when we give IO along with uh, the chemotherapy, uh, theoretical rationale is that and probably it does uh, contribute to whatever uh, uh, additional uh, responses or uh, that uh, sustained response, which is seen in a small subset of patients who benefit uh, well from this. Um, if you see um, at, at, at three year time point, it's just 5% of the small cell lung cancer patients surviving uh, with just chemotherapy alone. But uh, when IO is added, it's almost uh, more than 15% of them. So at 36 months, we see almost three times the patients being alive, which is quite remarkable for an aggressive cancer like small cell lung cancer. So the rationale is that, that it attracts a lot of T cells when there's a lot of cell lysis. And... Uh, and that's how it works. Exactly. So you were just pointing out how uh, the combination of chemo plus IO works out. I was just asking about why we were not able to get uh, excellent responses, even though they are smokers, high tumor mutational burden in small cell lung cancer. I agree. We have got responses, but small benefits. So the theory postulated behind this is uh, they tell that, you know, the small cell lung cancer, even though it has got high tumor mutational burden, it has got a very, very immunosuppressive microtumor environment. So we are not able to get that active T lymphocyte, uh, which can attack uh, actively and effectively against the tumor cells. That's the reason we are still stuck up with the little incremental benefits. But as you rightly pointed out, so the rationale behind the addition of chemotherapy to the IO agency is what you told. So that, uh, that's true. So the Caspian trial by design, so the Durva plus EP followed by Durva maintenance and EP alone, chemo alone, and the addition of tremolumab didn't make any difference. So that was dropped out. I mean, we are not discussing about that. So what are the study key differences between Caspian versus IMP 133, Dr. Uh, Ramprallad? Dr. Sharath, so can yes, you sir. just uh, uh, like they are out? pointed out uh, in the slide which you are just showing uh, in the Caspian trial, the control arm was uh, more uh, like how the real world practice is. They have allowed both the patients with uh, uh, both the platinum agents, be it uh, cisplatin versus carboplatin. And I think uh, uh, in the IMP trial, the drawback was they have just allowed uh, four cycles in the control arm. Here they have allowed uh, till six cycles in the control arm. And uh, the catch uh, here is in the Caspian trial, I think uh, uh, in the control arm, they have allowed the prophylactic cranial radiation, which was uh, not allowed uh, in uh, um, uh, IM power trial. So Caspian trial is more uh, where, is where more we relate because that is how the real world practice is because the control arm had almost replicated the real world practice. And then uh, we have a three-year uh, follow-up in the Caspian trial, where we, uh, whereas in the IM power, I think we ha only have a two-year benefit. Uh, and uh, some untreated uh, brain mets were also included, although the number was very small uh, and the... Uh, 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 it is crossing the median, uh, but the hazard ratios are still in the range of 0.7 even in the brain meds patient. So Caspian trial is more uh, relatable and easier to follow for us. Exactly. So I think uh, with that, we'll go ahead for the next. So it is more uh, real world uh, based, uh, you know, data. It has allowed cisplatin or caroplatin. It has taken the untreated or treated brain mates and optional PCI was also agreed. Yeah. So today preferred regimens for primary therapy for uh, extensive stage small cell lung cancer. Carboplatin plus etoposide plus durva, or cisplatin plus etoposide plus uh, etoposide plus durva, or carboplatin plus etoposide plus atajo. So the basic, uh, do you think the flexibility of platinum agent is an advantage in Caspian, Dr. Srinath? Uh, yes, sir. Definitely, it's uh, as uh, Dr. Sharat alluded to. Uh, it's kind of you know uh, relatable to the real world practice. Actually, <clears throat> that is uh, one thing. But of course, uh, uh, again, it's uh, more of a choice, as I must say, because uh, uh, there is no advantage of one platinum over the other, except for the toxicities. So uh, on the flip side, actually, I would like to say if Atizo was tried in the settings of Caspian, maybe do we uh, can we expect a better result? Because uh, uh, when 
if we are doing a real cross trial comparison right now i think they look similar i mean with so many restrictions on atiso so if we remove those restrictions add those untreated brain myths maybe do we get better or i don't know yeah so i'll try to answer that before that we will we'll just ask one more question dr shaini looking at this i am power 13 133 caspian 3 so what what are your thoughts between these two trials uh, in terms of the benefit what you get the benefit i should say is uh, more or less similar between the, both the trials sir so the choice of the drug is more or less like um, the physician's choice i must say exactly so that's what i was just trying yeah so basically if you look these two trials look at the medians both are same 12 months 12 months medians uh there's not much difference you know uh, but only thing is uh, we have uh, long term data in terms of 3 year os data with uh, durva where we had tripling of os uh, uh, 17% versus 5% with durva versus placebo so that's where uh, durva scores so and 3 year overall survival in the caspian trial look at the curves first 6 months absolutely there's no difference but there exists a difference at one year one and a half year two years and three years so the curves uh, you know uh, curves separate over time and uh, the benefit is durable even at three years so there is tripling of survivals overall survival 17% with durva versus 5% with placebo so that's what is the importance of using ivo where we look at os benefit and durable os benefit so yeah so this patient extensive stage small cell lung cancer with liver metastasis uh, received cisplatin etoposide and durvalumab completed four cycles with near cr and resolution of the liver lesions patient is on durva four weekly maintenance therapy a patient is monitored closely with serial scans every 3 months with no evidence of progression so with this i would like to ask all the panelists one by one so what what see usually what happens when the patient comes to us we tend to have the patient tends to have you know organ dysfunctions so what are your uh, takes on the incorporation of ivo if the patient has uh, liver derangements let us say lft is uh, enzymes are elevated more than three times of the upper limbs of the normal or if the creatinine is too so what are your thoughts on incorporation of ivo in the first line setting when you are going ahead with in combination with uh, chemo dr monica so ivo uses in this organ dysfunctions in um, terms of uh, liver as well as uh, renal so with the close monitoring i would still like to go for it if the liver dysfunction is because of the disease per se then um, uh, we should go ahead with io combination with chemotherapy or maybe um, give one or two cycles although it's a little unconventional give one or two cycles of chemotherapy alone and then once the disease burden in the liver comes down it will lead to some resolution of the liver dysfunction and then we can add on the io so that's a very special case scenario although it's not conventional it's not according to what they did in the trial um and renal dysfunction again it depends on what the cause of the renal dysfunction is sir i would like to evaluate whether it's dehydration any tumor lysis is there or any uh, uh, coexisting uh, comorbidities like uh, uh, diabetic kidney disease is there in such a case for a mild renal uh, dysfunction i would still go ahead with io combination but again with close monitoring monitor for proteinuria monitor for any autoimmune uh, manifestations any worsening of hepatitis and then we have to deal with it uh, as it comes so i wouldn't uh, uh, go for uh, uh, skipping io if at all there is a, a liver dysfunction because of disease if it's because of any other uh, reason then i would uh, think uh, twice before giving an io so dr rachna if the creatinine is too so would you like to add io to chemotherapy in the first uh, sitting itself or would you wait and uh, then add later what's your take on that So, uh, as uh, dr monica is saying i would also look out for the cause for the renal failure why the creatinine is too is there any other underlying comorbidities like the diabetes or hypertension which is commonly seen in such an elderly people who present with a small cell lung cancer so if it is not an autoimmune related renal disorder i would not uh, hesitate in giving an io along with chemotherapy for the patients with the creatinine of 2 but i would like to monitor continuously and see if there is an increase in the creatinine with the usage of io and also evaluate for the proteinuria and other manifestations if there are any 
and also look out for the other autoimmune manifestations of uh, iotherapy okay good so the, uh, the key take away message is so the patient uh, for the use of ivo in uh, along with uh, chemotherapy the patient we have good data to use uh, ivo if the creatinine clearance is more than 30 ml per minute one second thing is we don't have good data if the patient has altered liver enzymes more than two to three times of the upper limits of the normal to so wait so in these situations what we would like to do is first give one or two cycles of chemotherapy get one good response and after the liver liver enzymes are uh, settled down or the creatinine is settled down then go uh, go on to add the iv therapy in addition to the chemotherapy so that will be safe and we will not miss out the benefit as well so coming to the radiation therapy in extensive stage small cell lung cancer would you recommend prophylactical cranial irradiation or brain surveillance in this patient with extensive stage small cell lung cancer dr srinath sir if we get a complete response or uh, maybe very good uh, near complete uh, response uh, i would definitely consider for uh, uh, prophylactic cranial irradiation sir uh, uh, otherwise no because uh, uh, there is no survival benefit it's only uh, in terms of prevention of further brain mets okay uh, dr ram pralad what's your take on this PCI or brain surveillance. Dr. Sharad, uh, sir, it all depends on uh, uh, whether we are going with the immuno plus chemo combination or uh, just the uh, EP regimen. Because uh, in EP regimen, the jury is still uh, uh, the jury is not yet out. I think they are doing a randomized trial called Maverick trial where they are uh, contemplating. the benefit of uh, pca versus brain surveillance we have two trials like you showed in the earlier slide where the japanese trial had no improvement and the other trial showed a little improvement and uh, they are trying to answer this with a huge randomized trial uh, uh, this is when we are using ep and when we are using uh, ep plus immuno i think uh, uh, as far as the trial uh, Uh, design uh, goes uh, i don't think we uh, there is any uh, doubt of uh, adding pca we, they had just uh, uh, did brain surveillance so that is how i would take it uh, as of now sir yeah so previously we we had the data from european data that uh, pca improved os but now after the japanese data have come out so there is no improvement in overall survival so active brain surveillance with mri brain should be good enough because in fact sometimes most of the times the adding addition of pci worsens the quality of life so unless a uh, patient is not an active candidate for active surveillance we don't recommend pci nowadays in this extensive stage small cell lung cancer and especially when we are using ivo you know we have, we have a positive of data whether uh, integration of pci will really help us or no uh, that also we are not sure regarding the pci and what about the radiation therapy do you consider uh, thoracic radiation routinely for extensive stage small cell lung cancer yes or no uh, dr uh, maunika um sir again we don't have data to support uh, um, i think uh, thoracic radiation whether over and above uh, whether uh, in extensive stage whether we use chemo alone or chemo with io whether thoracic radiation over and above would help um so i wouldn't use it routinely sir if at all there's any residual disease which is symptomatic then maybe in that case that too with a purely palliative intent but uh, in patients in whom they've shown exceptionally good responses like a complete response um i'm not sure uh, whether thoracic rt will have any additional benefit mm -hmm. so essentially residual thoracic disease after systemic therapy with uh, oligometastatic kind of uh, picture less than or equal to 2 mets there we try to consolidate with rt for getting that extra benefits in the extensive stage so in in contrary as we all know the limited stage prophylactic cranial irradiation gives us the benefit undoubtedly so extensive stage now we are slowly moving towards the brain uh, mri brain surveillance and the addition of uh, the thoracic rt this is where it helps out in the consolidation so so dr venu gopal sir excellent uh, moderation as always last a minute to conclude sir sure sure so definitely so if you look at the caspian study 
the with brain mates or without brain mates there was os benefit with durvalumab versus placebo uh, hazards being 0.69 so but whereas in iam power 133 the comparator arm did fare better when uh, compared to the atajo so that's where i think durva scores over atajo undoubtedly so the patient receives systemic chemotherapy complete four cycles plus ivo with near cr and resolution of the liver lesion on durvalumab four weekly maintenance and has currently completed eight cycles of durvalumab with no evidence of progression on serial scales we have the four weekly maintenance that's one good part about uh, the maintenance of durva so and one last question how do you you know does the ps of the patient influence your decision on initiating doublet chemotherapy dr uh, Raj, uh, monica so how do you deal with poor performance status patients small cell lung cancer um uh, so upfront uh, if it's uh, because of svco uh, if the ps is poor again it depends on the cause if overall the general condition of the patient the nutrition status is poor then Uh, PS three and four, I wouldn't consider for any therapy, sir. I would put them on palliative care only. But uh, if there is SVCO and because of uh, the disease per se, the PS is poor, I would still give it a try, even if the patient is uh, PS three. Because when there's SVCO, obviously they'll be oxygen dependent; they'll not be able to move around. So that dictates the PS at that point of time. So um, I wouldn't exclude every patient who's PS three or four. Uh, I wouldn't deprive them of uh, treatment I, because it's a very chemosensitive disease, and it helps in palliation also the chemotherapy. That way also we should uh, we shouldn't uh, preclude them uh, from uh, giving some chemotherapy. Yes, excellent. So we'll try we'll try to find out what exactly is the cause of poor performance status. If it is due to small cell lung cancer like uh, pericardial effusion, pleural effusions, or very huge mass lesion. uh with svc syndromes those times we try to give the supportive care measures and try to improve the performance status and then try to treat the patients yeah so with that i think we have reached uh, the final slide of our uh, panel discussion so the first line durva plus ep has shown sustained improvements in overall survival compared with uh, the control arm and survival has tripled at 3 years with the use of durva plus ep versus ep alone so with that if the cost is not a constraint for getting that 3 year survival benefit tripling of os benefit i think we can consider the this combination of uh, this thank you so thank you so thank you so very much and, and i think it's a time to invite the next speaker and the moderator Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome and invite uh, Dr. M. V. T. Krishna Mohan, a senior consultant medical oncology from Indo-American Cancer Hyderabad. Hello, uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Krishna Mohan. So, uh, it's over. The floor is yours uh, for your moderation, please. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to invite the eminent uh, panelists, uh, Dr. Krishna Chaitanya from M. N. J. Cancer Institute, Hyderabad. uh dr rakesh pinati from hyderabad again dr vidya mansani from omega hospital dr harish uh, from yashoda hospital hyderabad dr vishal from mng cancer and dr vankat sampath uh, from uh, from apollo hospital hyderabad so all the esteemed panelists are with you over to you sir and you have half an hour to drive your moderation please over to you thank you i think you can all uh, see my screen and uh, my also and i hope all my panelists are there on board yes so all we have all yours we have discussed a lot of uh, theory over the evening now let us do some practical uh, uh, exercise so this uh, is a case based panel discussion and the idea is to select the best suited drug for egfr mutated non small cell lung cancer in the current day medical practice so uh, the st all the panelists are here and think and i think all of us have got enough and handful of experience in treating these patients so this is the patient to start discussion with she is a 49 year old lady a never smoker and this is the typical way she presents with uh, symptoms of uh, lung cancer which are of course non specific for lung cancer as such and also she has got bone metastasis this is the primary and then these are the representative images of uh, the bone metastasis there are there were multiple bone metastasis and also few lung nodules here and there making it a clear cut case of a stage 4 uh, cancer so the the biopsy is uh, is the the first thing is the biopsy and it is reported as a, a adenocarcinoma of uh, uh, of uh, lung cancer adenocarcinoma and now the testing so let us uh, start 
uh, 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 asking us, uh, asking uh, one by one, Dr. Vindhya, so what is your, uh, in a situation like this, uh, what is your routine testing of molecular markers in NSCLC patients? Do you, what is the uh, modality you use for uh, this thing? Uh, we routinely do the NGS panel for this patient, the limited uh, lung panel NGS, which uses seven or eight uh, markers, along with the PDL1 testing by IHC, okay. rather than going step by step. So, NGS would be my uh, test to go. So, could you re recollect uh, any time when we used to do sequential testing? Yes. Huh. So initially, we used to do EGFR, and then if the EGFR was negative, then we used to do for uh, go for ROS or ALK and ROS. Yeah. So we used to believe, or even now, I think we most of us believe that uh, the lung cancer, the driver mutations are almost yeah. mutually exclusive. So at this point in time, I would like to ask any of my panelists to take up uh, in your experience or uh, the whatever you can recollect or uh, recall. Are there any uh, good number of patients who had? One, more than one driver mutation in your uh, uh, clinical practice? Vindhya, Chaitanya, Rakesh, Harish, yes, Vishal. We, uh, we had one have patient. Two cases right now, sir. Yeah. Uh, who, have, uh, who has both um, uh, EGFR and ALK. Uh, both mm -hmm. the cases are like that. Both of them are... Uh, then initially it was... Uh, she was started on EGFR, then progressed, uh, then kept on ALK inhibitor. Uh, okay. One case is still on EGFR inhibitor. Okay. So anyone else? Uh, Dr. Vindhya was telling something. I have. We had one patient with EGFR and ALK. Yeah. Yes, sir. I do more. I do have one. EGFR, EGFR uh, you know, uh, upfront 37 and TM and deletion 19. And one was like T exam 20 insertion with exam 19 uh, deletion. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Nice. So that's about it. So uh, I, can I ask you, Dr. Krishna Zetanya, so what is... Uh, do you do lipid biopsy at all? If, if at all you do lipid biopsies, when do you con consider this upfront lipid biopsy? Sir, upfront I don't uh, prefer at all. And where, very rare situations where I can't get a uh, you know, uh, uh, diet tissue biopsy at the time, I would uh, uh, consider very elderly, very where they're not totally reluctant for a biopsy. Uh, only those cases, sir. Otherwise, I would prefer a proper tissue biopsy. Okay. So, Dr. Rakesh, in, in lung cancer management, let us not uh, uh, take about any particular scenario, first line or second line. So when, when do you like to do a lipid biopsy in, in the entire lung cancer practice? Rakesh, yeah, I would like to do it. Sample. Yes, I am here, sir. So in tissues in which there is a uh, uh, bone only metastasis, uh, those, those uh, <laughs> tissue not, not adequate, uh, then probably liquid biopsy makes more sense. But I think we are running a trial, so, so we are doing it simultaneously along with tissue biopsy. Uh, if finances are also not a concern, also we will try to do both tissue and liquid biopsy simultaneously because there is 15% discordance between uh, the tissue biopsy and liquid biopsy. So maybe there will be 10 to 15 percent patients who will benefit from liquid biopsy as well. Yeah. Mostly in patients who progress on uh, these uh, TKIs, especially EGFR TKIs, to check for the T790M mutation, at the time of progression, we prefer to do a liquid biopsy. I think even at that point in time, we would like to uh, procure some tissue, however, convincing the patient. If possible, a uh, repeat biopsy would be a test to go, otherwise a liquid biopsy. Dr. Harish, so in uh, so we, we talked about the role of MRI uh, screening of the brain, MRI scanning of the brain in small cell. So what is your take in non-small cell? Uh, in non-small cells, uh, especially patient doesn't have any symptom, yeah. uh, I would like to do the CCT head and uh, if at all any sus no suspicious lesion, I'll not, I'll would like to skip. Yeah. Is there anyone uh, who routinely does MRI brain in all patients with non-small cell lung cancer? Dr. Vishal, what is, what is your practice? Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, unless the patient is symptomatic, uh, usually uh, don't do uh, MRI, but uh, as a screening procedure, CECT head is good enough. Yeah. Anyway, we are doing a whole body PET CT scan nowadays. I think it yeah. it does cover a reasonably good uh, uh, this thing imaging of the brain. Okay, agreed. So I think uh, yeah. all of us will agree that uh, the routine molecular testing. I think nowadays we are doing the reflex PCR testing or the panel based testing, and 
liquid biopsy is only in selected uh, areas and cns imaging is only when clinically uh, indicated so so this is the uh, biopsy report of our patient so she underwent a, a biopsy and then the egfr uh, panel testing and as you can see here the deletion 19 is uh, mutation is uh, is detected so dr sampath what is your take how are you going to manage Uh, sir, with the current data available, uh, osimertinib is uh, good enough. But uh, keeping in view that the flora study mainly focused on non-Asian, I mean, population, I would still uh, equally consider uh, other options like uh, lotinib and uh, gefitinib. Okay, good. So, is there uh, uh, going back to uh, Dr. Vindya? So, your EGFR mutation, deletion nineteen or L eight five eight R. So, do you see any difference between uh, these two subgroups? In yeah, the lesion nineteen uh, um, seems to be a, a better prognosis group compared to the L eight five eight R, and in the lesion nineteen, I would prefer a uh, prefer osimertinib uh, as a single agent. Um, in both in both the mutations, I would prefer osimertinib, uh, but in the lesion nineteen, the uh, benefit is better. The PFS and the OS benefit is there. um whereas in l858 r though there is a pfs benefit uh, i'm not sure whether the os benefit is clearly there so uh, on the basis of the response yes i my choice wouldn't vary between the two but my uh, expectation or the prognosis varies between the two yeah. so dr krishna jaitanya what's your take on the first line preferred treatment Uh, sir first line i would like to give the best treatment options uh, first i would prefer rosimertinib because it has shown a single drug with a good uh, you know uh, toxicity profile uh, giving a good uh, pfs benefit i would uh, prefer rosimertinib but um, in a set of patients where i work a government setup where they can't afford this i would uh, definitely keep option of other tkis like gefitinib along with chemotherapy where also it has given the almost equal pfs benefit compared to rosimertinib and i haven't tried any uh, erlotinib with the vegf anti uh, you know anti vegf uh, i didn't uh, try till now yeah. dr vindya you are talking you are telling something yeah the same thing that's what i was going to add dr chaitanya has uh, okay dr rakesh your your take on the combination egfr combinations rakesh i would the... prefer to use a combination yes sir yeah. i would use the co- Combination in L858R uh, in deletion 19. I think the first generation, second generation monotherapy as well as third generation monotherapy is good enough. But the responses PFS is bit uh, lower in L858R. So in that patients probably I can use uh, EGFR TK with the uh, ramisrumab or chemotherapy. Again, osimertinib is the de facto standard for all uh, mutations of EGFR. But if affordability is an issue, probably I can go with uh, gefitinib plus chemotherapy. Sure, uh, Dr. Harish, are you in in practice? Are you using using any EGFR combinations uh, in your practice? Yes, sir. I've used uh, three patients with EGFR with chemotherapy, just to know, especially uh, some young patients around the uh, 30 to 50 age group. I've used the EGFR gefitinib plus chemotherapy combination at the PIM PIM and uh, gefitinib maintenance. So they are doing well, and uh, after one year, uh, nobody has progressed so far. Fingers crossed. I'm expecting the same result for as in the phase three study is done in Mumbai. Interesting, interesting to to note, Doctor Vishal, your uh, comments on the combination EGFR TKIs, or would you uh, think of any situation? Can you recollect and say the the sequencing of uh, TKIs has helped uh, any one of these patients? Sir, uh, as uh, other panelists has opined, like uh, first we have to give the best statement. Like osimertinib is a way to go. Uh, and uh, uh, talking about the combination of TKI with chemotherapy, yes, uh, in the mutations where we have L eight five eight, there probably the TKI plus chemotherapy would help. Thank you, Doctor Vishal. I think all of us would uh, kind of agree that uh, uh, though EGFR mutated lung is bundled into one, we we now understand that EGFR deletion nineteen is slightly different from L eight five eight R. and uh, of course the osimertinib so far if you look at the the data osimertinib is the only drug which has shown uh, overall survival benefit the flora data 
and uh, uh, the combination is one thing which is uh, interesting especially the data from uh, the uh, the tata hospital uh, group which was discussed in asco some time back dr uh, dr sapat uh, have you yes. ever used this combination of uh, chemotherapy with gefitinib uh, yes sir uh, in late 58 hour uh, mutation patients i uh, use bemetaxel <laughs> carbapenem with gefitinib but yeah. uh, Uh, side effects are uh, relatively more in this uh, when we use, when we combine with gefitinib yeah. like uh, rash and uh, mucositis diarrhea are relatively higher sure and uh, this is what data at at a glance what we had uh, uh, seen across the literature the clgb study the nej study the tata hospital study i think combinations do work but uh, of course there is nothing as good as osimertinib which is uh, visible and very evident so this is uh, what happened to our patient uh, so she could not afford uh, the uh, osimertinib so and of um, also this was 2016 17 the case of 2016 and 17 so i started her on uh, gefitinib so at 6 uh, months you can see the response that's what all of us uh, expect the the response is, uh, is so good and uh, at 6 months but then what happened is after the completion of 13 months on gefitinib you can see the disease progression not only in the lung but also in 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 rare sites like uh, peripheral uh, uh, disease extra thoracic disease subcutaneous tissue intramuscular and then uh, so on and so forth the disease has has progressed so at this point in time i think the uh, panelists already told that we would like to obtain an additional uh, biopsy if not possible then a lipid biopsy so rebiopsy was done and it showed a t790m that's what it it showed and so dr vindya starting from you again so what do you think uh, what is your incidence of t790m mutation in your patients or in your hospital around anywhere around 30 30 to 35 40% 30 to 40% krishna chaitanya your uh, mnj has uh, do we have some some kind of rough estimate uh yes sir maybe around 130 yeah I agree for one third. Okay, thirty percent. Yeah, yeah, thirty percent. Sure, sure. So, how do you manage uh, somebody who has progressed on uh, first generation TKIs? And uh, so, can I ask uh, Dr. Rakesh? Yes, sir. I think if somebody progressed on first generation TKI, I think the biopsy and uh, CT DNA both combined uh, should give us maximum chance of getting the T zone and DM. i think the chance of uh, t790m is anywhere anyway between 45% to 50% based upon how strictly you go over the biopsy and ct dna together uh, treatment choice again based upon the presence or absence of t790m if it is uh, positive then definitely osimertinib and if it is negative then probably this patient can go for a uh, platinum combination if there are good peers borderline peers then single agent chemotherapy and if affordable then they can go for uh, uh, the abcp protocol of uh, m power 150 yeah So I have I have a doubt question here. Like we had a patient of exon nineteen uh, mutation, and then uh, he was uh, put on gefitinib, and then progress post progression biopsy was done, which showed that exon nineteen mutation was still present, but there was no other uh, resistance mutation. So how do we go about in such cases? It will be present. It will still be present because whenever we do a biopsy, that the 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 baseline mutation, the driver mutation remains, and then T seven the T seven ninety M is added to it. So, in such patients, can we shift them to osimertinib? Uh, stronger uh, inhibitor. So, this there is no data, I think, because if one TKI works, sir, they, there is. Yeah, somebody said. I think there is is a data. There is data to suggest that continuation of gefitinib with the palliative chemotherapy is of no value. No, the, uh, the, but the, we don't have as of now data to suggest. Rakesh, the question is: If somebody progresses on gefitinib, can you switch them on to osimertinib? If there is no, no definitely, sir. Yeah. Sir, there's an option. There's an option uh, going for osimertinib in second line when they progress on gefitinib, erlotinib, bufotenib, or dapamatinib. Osimertinib we can use in second line, irrespective of T seven and T M mutation. So when when you clearly know that there is no T seven and T M, so is there sir? Is there any point in switching over to uh, uh, through osimertinib? That's what Doctor India was telling too. Yes, sir. It's potent. It's more potent. Efficacious, even on progression, but first line TKI, we can use osimertinib and check. We can use, but see, there is the even the ACN recommends that if somebody is on osimertinib and there is oligo progression, you can continue osimertinib. Somebody progressing on gefitinib, I am not sure. 
So, Dr. Harish Vishal Sampath, your uh, thoughts on this? Uh, I, if, if not used, I would definitely go with Osama Tilib uh, in second line. Okay. Irrespective of T7 and TM. Yeah. So, they, they, there is some phase 2 data who say that uh, Osama Tilib, ATMG having double the dose to 160 MG once it progresses and things like that. So, I think we will leave this question here. So, Dr. Vindya, your question is, I think, partly unanswered. Rather to say that it's partly answered, I think it's partly unanswered. But for my choice uh, will be not to uh, switch over to Asimatinib if there is no T790M and uh, think of other things. So I will leave it here. Uh, in closing, the question is open. We are running short of time. Means. So this is what happened to our patient. So she was started on Asimatinib and after six months of Asimatinib, she had responded uh, well here. This is uh, before six months and then this is after six months. And after 13 months of on Osimotinib, you can see the, the lung disease uh, remained uh, stable, but then the disease has progressed in bone and then the subcutaneous uh, parts of the body. So here, uh, the sequential use of TKIs, first generation, and then the later, gen later generations, we could give about uh, 26 months of uh, PFS to this patient. And then subsequently, she was uh, uh, changed over to the chemotherapy, and then she lived for another six months or so and then drive because of uh, progressive disease and brain metastasis also. So this is about uh, the, this patient. So uh, somebody, as I was asking the UGF, uh, the T7NTM mutation data in our hospital, this is uh, Dr. Rakesh also knows this data. So in our hospital, the T7NTM mutation rate is about 52% in the study, in this small study which we did. And of course, majority of these patients we did uh, with the rebiopsy, and then the, the change of histology was seen in only 2.6% of patients. And with uh, second line osimertinib, the, the survival, the PFS is about 12, 12 and a half months. That's what we saw in our patient also. So coming to uh, coming uh, the, to, to Dr. Harish. So regarding the osimertinib, now all of us, I think, are more or, more or less convinced that whenever we are uh, using EGFR TKI, it's osimertinib could be better. And what is your take on selection? Do you like to select any patient, particular patient for osimertinib, or uh, you think it's good in everyone? Uh, especially those who have uh, intracranial uh, metastasis, uh, brain mates, definitely yes, go for uh, osimertinib. And uh, we can get away with uh, RT in some cases where they have no symptoms with single agent osimertinib. In that case, other first line, uh, we have to add. Uh, this uh, radiation, especially while considering alerting about in the first line. In the first line. Dr. Vishal, asymptomatic brain metastasis in EGFR positive uh, uh, this, uh, cancer. So what do you, lung cancer? So what do you do? In asymptomatic? Uh, yeah, we, we would consider uh, giving osimertinib the double the dose. Uh, we can uh, hold radiation like uh, if patient is asymptomatic, we can just give a single agent osimertinib, double the dose, and we can continue. Double dose osimertinib, Dr. Sampath, your take? Uh, I don't have a personal experience, sir, but uh, uh, I mean, I, I would consider it. I can consider it. Double dose or standard dose? Uh... Standard dose. I would go with standard dose. Standard yeah. dose. Standard dose is sufficient. Correct. So double dose is only for lepto leptomeningeal disease in the Bloom trial, yeah. but not for the parenchymal metastasis. Yeah. And uh, whenever there is asymptomatic brain mate, I think when you are using osimertinib, all of them had either a stable disease or a partial remission or complete remission. So uh, asymptomatic brain mate, there is no need to address if you are using osimertinib. But if you are going for other TKI, maybe we should uh, think, uh, you know, because they don't penetrate the brain as good as osimertinib, we should irradiate and then be on safer side. Yeah, so even uh, the, the Lux lung uh, fatinib data also, Asymptomatic brain metastasis, I think these TKIs are good enough, the, especially the second and third generation are good enough for the intracranial penetration and their intracranial responses are also quite uh, quite good. So I think uh, all of us uh, do agree that osimertinib is superior at uh, TKI, but the question is what happens after uh, resistance to osimertinib? So I'll go back to Dr. India. So if somebody you started somebody on uh, osimertinib and then somebody progresses on that. So what is your take? Uh, so uh, there are studies which have evaluated the mut uh, mutation landscape in uh, uh, post-osimertinib and they have found varied uh, 
mutations there is no single uh, transformation which uh, is most common uh, there is one particular mutation uh, some uh, s797 or something but uh, post osimertinib uh, chemotherapy with io combination which was studied in the one of the uh, immunotherapy trials um, has shown some benefit so i would go for chemo uh, with or without io combination sure dr krishna chetane your approach will be the same um, uh sir so again uh, going for a biopsy and seeing for any histology or any other new mutations come up that will be a routine practice secondly if nothing is found i would prefer only single chemotherapy rather than adding a immunotherapy in this case because even in second line if they have earlier uh, molecular markers positive they don't respond to immunotherapy secondly if you add immunotherapy post osimertinib they'll have a lot of toxicity with pneumonitis even though i am not having my uh, practical experience this is theoretical so we shouldn't use immunotherapy when there was a egfr positive earlier even in second line and third line never but there are trials which have included patients who progressed on uh, osimertinib in the immunotherapy group and they have shown responses i don't think we should make a blank statement that we should not use yeah so that the truth lies somewhere in between so i think uh, this this could be a debate uh, for self so rakesh your take on adding immunotherapy at progression in egfr positive lung cancer sir i think we have data to suggest that uh, in immunotherapy along with chemotherapy is not shown to improve overall survival i think immunotherapy with uh, chemotherapy along with bevacizumab as we seen in imper 150 has definitely shown an improvement in overall survival this is contrary to what we are seen in uh, imper 130 where it was only atezolizumab plus uh, paclitaxel alone which has not shown improvement in overall survival but addition of bevacizumab along with paclitaxel and atezolizumab has definitely some benefit but again uh, this is not very huge benefit it is only in matter of months and hazard ratios are in only uh, 0.80 or 0.85 not very great uh, differences but as of now we have data to suggest that there is some benefit in adding both immunotherapy and vegf inhibition along with chemotherapy so more more interestingly is what uh, we find uh, find in the literature is that the when when they were evaluating the responses the the mechanisms of resistance to osimertinib the change in histology is seems to be more common than the first line uh, egfr tkis and the change in histology is one thing which is uh, which should definitely be looked for when somebody becomes resistant to osimertinib so uh, dr vishal are you convinced with this uh, flora overall analysis yeah uh, because uh, it has improved uh, pfs and ofs significantly and less uh, side effects and better cns tolerability so yes uh, data is convincing convincing yeah so dr uh, harish what do you think the the argument is that uh, to use the best drug up front is that when you use the best drug up front if you don't use the best best drug up front then the chance of uh, the patients receiving that drug subsequently goes down and as summarized in this slide so do you think uh, this is correct in our situation dr harish sir as such there is no uh, valid comparison with the uh, only uh, internal comparison i can definitely choose osimertinib over uh, sequence and uh, especially patient patients are portable and having cns max and uh, if not uh, even uh, uh, using the second line and uh, using third line chemotherapy more or less will coming to the same place but uh, though we have to fit it hard because we might losing the almost 30 to 40% of every line uh, so may not be taking up the drug in second and third line because of the worsening of performance status and some other reasons mm. so, so i think uh, that is uh, that's about the discussion i think all of us sampath you have uh, anything to add uh, dr sampath your choice would still be osimertinib <laughs> Uh, yes sir but uh, in patients with uh, exon 20 insertions and other rare mutations yeah. if someone has a rare mutation cefatinib is also a preferable option and in exon 20 insertions uh, option of chemotherapy is ideal upfront and uh, even uh, recurrent patients uh, though chemotherapy i prefer but uh, the focus should be on finding the resistance uh, and driving mutation and uh, i mean resistance mechanism and targeting that and um, uh, i mean now we have uh, like depending on whether it is transformation to small cell cancer or depending on whether metx cell mutation is there uh, we have to take the decisions uh, it's time to do that i i feel now agreed agreed fantastic so i think we had uh, uh, more or less uh, common consensus that osimertinib yes, all of us would agree that osimertinib uh, gives the best os and pfs till date 
and uh, the the argument is that if we uh, if we if we say that we start the earlier generation TKIs and then we don't know how many of them will develop 790M, and uh, subsequently they may not be eligible for osimertinib, and it's one thing, and it should be safe. And uh, the the quality of life, I think all of us will agree that osimertinib is a good drug or literally easier uh, drug to handle. So anybody has any opinion to say about any rare side effect they saw with osimertinib? Anyone starting from Vindya, Krishna, Chaitanya, Rakesh, Harish, Vishal, Sampat? No. So I think it's the best drug, sir, without any toxicity compared to other TKIs. This is the best. Agreed. Yeah, yeah. So the only thing is, I think we should... Uh, Ask the company to cut down on the cost or uh, increase the uh, support so that we can we can, we can uh, make it uh, available for most of the patients. I think with this uh, a few comments, we will conclude this panel discussion. I, I thank each one of you for your active contribution. Uh, however, I think two questions are a uh, little controversial in, in our discussion. So what do you do after uh, uh, progression on first line TKS? Osi Martinib is, uh, I think we will try to answer uh, subsequently. And then the use of... Uh, immunotherapy combinations after the progression on osimertinib. And these are the two questions which are really interesting and I don't mm -hmm. think there is one uh, correct answer. We there will... is some data. Yeah. Sir, especially after osimertinib, there is some data, especially skipping immuno, uh, starting with immu, uh, chemotherapy. And after three months of stopping osimertinib, immunotherapy was uh, shown to be uh, safe. At least three months gap. Once the patient has progressed, we can start the chemotherapy and we can wait three months and add the osimertinib after three months, uh, after three months, immunotherapy can be added, which has shown to be safe in some perspective data. Sure, sure. Thank you, everyone. I think we'll conclude. We are running late. And uh, over to Dr. Venu. Sir, thank you very much, sir. Krishnamon, sir. That was a fantastic talk. Uh, you know, uh, very practical approach for this topic, I felt. So thank you very much for that great moderation. So with that, I think we have come to the end of this uh, CME live webinar. So we have had great talks and great uh, moderations. I felt I have learned a lot uh, from this uh, live webinar. So I thank all speakers and all panelists. So uh, panelists, uh, one, uh, Dr. Rachna, Dr. Monica, Dr. Shaini, Dr. Srinath, and uh, Dr. Sharath, and Dr. Uh, Rampralath, and panelists, two Dr. Venkat Sampath, Dr. Rakesh, Dr. Vindya Vasni, Dr. Krishna Chaitanya, Dr. Vishal and Dr. Harish. So everyone, thank you very much for your kind, uh, active participation. And uh, last, lastly, I would like to thank all uh, our academic partners, all former companies who has uh, extended their support. And last but not least, Tarun Horizon Conference Management has uh, well done it. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, uh, Dr. Venu sir and everyone. And uh, mm, good night from all of us from the organizing team.